All right, here we go. Michael Jai White, welcome back. Yes, I'm back. You're back. It's been uh, a oh, first time this year. Is it? I think so. I think yeah. last time it was like December or something. Might be right. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a minute. Okay. It's been a minute. Okay. A lot of stuff has happened since then. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I want to definitely get out because I never talk about it. All right, let's go. Yeah. Everybody keeps, everybody always approaches me about martial arts lessons and fitness stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I, I got my own app. It's called Dojo by Michael Jai. Ah, okay. So if anybody wanted to learn that stuff or whatever, do that. Because people come up to me and say like, hey, well, you know, can you teach me? I'm like... I don't know what it is. Maybe they watch kung fu movies and there's always a, a benevolent teacher teaching somebody for nothing. <laughs> now, if, if I was teaching you and I gave you private lessons, how much do you think that would cost? Come on, really? Right. So, but anyway, I finally got, you know, my, my system down and it's called Dojo by Michael Jai. So anybody want to learn that stuff, pull that up on your, uh, your apps. So there it is. I just want to get that out. Yeah. I'm about to download it right okay. after this. Okay, cool. Well, speaking of martial arts, mm. Javante Tank Davis yeah. knocked out Ryan Garcia. Oh, yeah. And like the way he did it, it was like this delayed reaction. Mm -hmm. It was like he hit him with a body shot and he was like up, 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 <laughs> up, and then down. Yeah. And he wasn't getting back up again. That's a liver shot. Yeah. Is you that know, what that is? Oh, hell yeah, brother. It's like right here, you go up. That's where your liver is. Okay. So on this, on this, your right side. And that done right, it shuts you down. And But it's a delayed reaction. As you, anybody, you know, boxing fans know that Oscar De La Hoa was hit with that same shot when he fought Bernard Hopkins. Mm. And it's it's debilitating. Okay. Have you ever been hit in the liver? Yes, I have. I've been kicked there. I've been, yeah, so I know what, <laughs> I know what that feels like. Yeah. Okay, and yeah. what exactly? So when you get hit, you just can't stand anymore. It sh it really shuts you down, almost like right. I don't know if you've ever been tased mm -hmm. or whatever. But it's like your whole nervous system shuts down. Uh, it's it's a it's a pain that you do not. You'd rather get kicked in the face than kicked in the liver. Right, because when when he went down, it's not like he just got knocked out and he's unconscious. It's like he went down and he took a knee, mm -hmm. and it seemed like he was. Okay, like he seemed like he was going to stand back up. That's right? only for people who don't understand, <laughs> like me, right? If, like, I think he could have stood up, but he knew not to do that. Oh, because it would have just been because he would have stood up and he would have been in such excruciating pain. Still, it would have shut his system down. It's it's like I mean, the will of a fighter is like like no other. So that will, when you're trying to tell yourself, "I'm going to overcome this," and you can't. I mean, fighters' wills, are, you know, it's unfortunate people don't understand that. It's like, I wish, you know, it's, it's sad, but I wish everybody can get a liver shot just to, just to know what that feels like. And then just to go, now, just spell your name. <laughs> just spell your name after this liver shot. See if you can do it. So it, it's, it's a pain that people who might have got punched in the stomach think, oh, cool, come on, come, you know, suck it up. Right. Now, it's not the same thing. Oh, so it's not like you lose all your breath. There's no. Some, there's something totally different no, going on. At that no, point. it's it's nervous system. It's a oh, it's a whole nervous system breakdown. You, you, you How hard you can try, and these people are trained. They're trained to fight 15 some odd rounds. But if you can't physically get up behind that, believe me, it's something different. Something that most people have never experienced. Well, you know, before the fight, both guys were talking big shit. Mm. They were running their mouths. And m a matter of fact, on Instagram Live, they actually bet, bet. their purses. Yeah. Yeah. Which, mean, does that ever really happen, though? Does any, any fighters ever bet their actual purse? I'm, I'm sure they have. But I've I never mean, actually heard of it. I, not not I, on, a, on a big, on a, you know, on the big stage. So, yeah, they were talking a bunch. They said they would bet their purse. But then... After Tank won, and they asked him, you know, are, are you going to want his, you know, Ryan's purse? He was like, no, nah, he can keep that. Yeah. He can keep that. Man, Tank, Tank got a whole lot of new fans behind that. Yeah. Because I, I, I love it. I love his attitude and how he's just like, cause especially in these times where people are like this, uh, you know, there's no honor anymore, you know? And, and for him to show that, it's like, come on, he, this dude is, is suffering enough. You know, I don't have to like berate him. And especially that's the stronger man. Actually, Tank's 
level. He was several levels above Ryan Garcia. Seemed like it. It was several. I mean, he even was, said that. He said yeah. everything Ryan threw at me, I, I already saw it coming. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I was already prepared for everything. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, Ryan claimed that there was a mole in his camp. <laughs> what, what, what could a mole do? <laughs> That's what I said. Yeah. <laughs> That's just ridiculous. People are stretching for things like that. I'm sorry. I mean, it doesn't matter about the um, hydration clause, anything else. Okay, so tell me about this hydration clause. I was going to mention that next. Tell me, I don't quite understand the hydration clause, so explain it to me. Well, what what, what happens is um, usually when you're seeing fighters fight, there's a disadvantage. The bigger guy can can shrink down Mm -hmm. and make weight, and then they hydrate back up to who they, what they really are. So they stop drinking water for how long? It depends on the person. But what, like, imagine- average, if, like, like, what was an example? Oh, see, what, what it is like, so I'm usually around 2.30, right? Uh, I can run, dehydrate, take uber ursi vitamin C, all these different things like natural diuretic type of stuff and get down to 2.05. 25 pounds. Yeah, to, to fight at 2.05. Okay. That's temporary. Yeah. Because your body's made up of mostly water. So if you manipulate the water, you manipulate the majority of your body weight. Mm-hmm. It's a trick. So I I make weight at 205. Then immediately once I step off that scale, I start drinking and putting the, yeah. you know replenishing. And you go back to your I go weight. back up to 225, 230. Yeah. And I'm fighting a guy who's really 205. Mm. And fighters understand a weight differential is major. Yeah, that's that's a major power and you know, strength difference. Um, and so that's a, that, so imagine having a clause that says, I can't hydrate up to 230. I mm-hmm. can only hydrate up to 210. You see what I'm saying? Okay. Then, then I don't have that 30 pound advantage. So who lost the most weight in that fight? Was it? Davis or well, we 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 don't we don't know. I, I, or Garcia. I, I would I would imagine how it's structured that um, Garcia had to come down a little further, right? Because he's taller. Yeah, I would but, imagine that. But but Tank is a lot bulkier. Tank has knocked out people way bigger than him, way bigger than him. That's that's unusual. But Tank's uh, power is is unusual for his size. Right. I mean, I've interviewed him. He, he's, how tall is he? He's not that tall. Five, six. Five, six. Believe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Ryan looked like he was about, what, close to six feet or something? Or? I'd say five, ten, five, eleven. Five, ten, maybe? five, eleven. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Close yeah. to six feet. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, I, I already knew that Tank was going to win. I had no doubt in my mind. I mean, he was also the heavy favorite. Yeah. You know, because I think like Drake put like a million dollars on Tank, and I think his payoff was like cool, 1.38 million. Yeah, meaning that like you see, what I'm saying you're you're not even doubling your money, <laughs> like right yeah, against yeah, Tank. Yeah. Everyone knows what's gonna happen. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I I think you know it's you know with 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 Ryan's left hook, which everybody knows, and of course, including Tank, knows that that his that's his best weapon. Well, then you just circumvent that weapon, and he did so masterfully. It was it was pretty easy for him to do that. Yeah, yeah. It was. It, I, I love seeing, seeing seeing great technique and strategy, and uh, they had that. It was it was easier than I thought it would be. Well, uh, Pitbull Cruz, who was the number four guy in lightweight division, he, he was talking a bunch of trash against Ryan uh, Garcia mm-hmm. after the fight. And uh, I mean, people actually sp- spoke highly about Pitbull. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts on him? Don't know. Don't know. Don't know. I, I haven't followed it. Um, uh, but you know, from what I've seen, you know, because I mean, I was late to the to the party with Ryan. You know, I see things, and I'm going, well, he looks good against <laughs> these guys who have no no real footwork. And I was like, where's Ryan's footwork? He's got, he's got, he's gonna be, he's gonna be pretty great. I mean, but he's got, there's a lot of things he's got to combat. You know, he's he, he hasn't. I don't know. I don't know if he's ready for the upper echelon yet. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, Ryan was saying how he hopes there'll be a rematch at one point, but he's yeah. not like you could tell by the way he was saying it. He knows it's not no, going to be. You could tell it's you not going to be a part two close. anytime soon, it if ever. It wasn't close. Yeah, yeah it was kind of like a pie in the sky. Maybe one day, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I can maybe get back up here again. But yeah, yeah. But so, right. so who's who's Tank going to fight next? I, I, possibly Haney or or Lomachenko. 
uh, or um, Shakur Stevens. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, is Canelo the, in a totally different weight class? Or yeah, they? Yeah, he's, I believe. They they go up and down nowadays, and it's about a money fight and all that kind of stuff. Canelo's a big dude. Let's take a look. Yeah. Tank is at 135 pounds. Mm -hmm. Damn. Mm -hmm. And Canelo's 168. Yeah. So there's a 30 pound difference between. Yeah, the Canelo has um, has moved up to super middleweight. Cause he used to be. Remember, he used to fight uh, Mayweather. Yeah, but remember, he was really he was small. Big for, he, he was right. really big for Mayweather. Yeah. And that was that was dangerous for Mayweather with, with a guy that. That powerful, but I mean, Mayweather just—it was checkers versus chess, right? Well, did you hear that Mayweather is going to fight John Gotti the third? I heard this. Yeah, I just thought it's an exhibition. I I heard, yeah, yeah, it's an exhibition. That's, if that's the word you want to use, John Gotti the third. I've never even heard of this guy up until this moment. Right. I mean, I've heard of John Gotti, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And John Gotti Jr. So this is John Gotti Jr.'s son? I think so. Uh, no, Mayweather you know, just... These days, people name themselves any damn thing. I know, right. <laughs> so I don't know if he's even in a relation, but he probably is. Uh, Mayweather does some smart things, and he knows that if that name brings attention. There you go. Yeah, I mean, listen, uh, at this point, Mayweather's just getting checks. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's really going to fight anyone who could potentially hurt him. You know, it's just, yeah. You're talking to an old guy who's kept kept up pretty pretty well. So I kind of feel like Mayweather was so far ahead of the rest of the pack that he could legitimately fight somebody. Well, and I mean, still like, win. Well, yeah, like, I feel a, you. But a, I feel like the last champ. fight, the last legitimate fight he had, and even this is not a legitimate fight completely, is Conor McGregor, because that's not. Good. Meaning that he Connor's not a, a boxer. No. See? No. So was it Pacquiao? His last legitimate fight? No, well, legitimate fight, man. He he went out against um shoot, who, who did he go out against? I, I forget. I forget, but he Let's look this up. Okay, so his last official fight was Connor McGregor, which was that, yeah, that shouldn't be that shouldn't even be counted. Yeah. What what was his date this was 2017 yeah. this is six years ago before then was burdo yeah yeah, yeah that's exactly uh, andre that's exactly yeah. andre yeah. burdo which was 2015 so he has yeah. not fought legitimately in eight years I, I i if there's anybody who could still fight and win it's that guy because it's the intellect to me mm. right he is so far ahead of everybody just psychologically again i think he's the like to watch him change strategy in the middle of a round it's it's again it's just, he's playing chess and other people are playing checkers just figuring that out and and being able to be in control of your body well enough to enact those changes it puts you leagues ahead of other people mm -hmm. i don't want to sound big-headed but i know for a fact because I've been such a nerd of, you know, of technique. It's put me in the ring with people who you would think I don't have any business in the ring with. And, and I walked away going, wow, I, I, it is about, I mean, you know, thank God I'm, I'm still able to, uh, my body still responds to my mind, right? I still have that mind muscle connection. That's not going to be there in the future. So that's why I do it still to, to this day. But I feel that Floyd, without having a bunch of wear and tear on him, and even when he fought Canelo Alvarez, it's what you're watching is a superior thinker that's, you know, going up against somebody at, at, his, at a very prime physical level and, oh, oh yeah. what, you know, masterfully beat him. So yeah, that 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 portion of Mayweather, I don't think that part diminishes, you know. Unless you know people get old after some time, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, things have changed. But I don't know. I think he could beat pretty much anybody out there. Well, uh, Mike Tyson said he's open to fighting uh, Roy Jones Jr. 
uh, or Evander Holyfield for the right price. Mm. Now, the Roy Jones Jr. fight, I mean, it was entertaining. I kind of felt like Mike went easy on him. Yeah. Uh, but with Holyfield, I don't think he's going to have that option. I think him in the ring with Holyfield is going to be a real slugfest. Uh, don't, you don't think so? Uh, again, I think the both fights were psychological. For This is my opinion. Uh, I believe Mike Tyson fought somebody who has always been like a big brother to him. And psychologically, that was a, an obstacle. Because Wait, so you, who was a you're saying Roy Jones? No, I'm talking about with Mike Tyson and Holyfield. So who was the big brother? Holyfield. Really? Oh my God! Yeah, Holyfield is the big brother to Mike. For, for yeah, you you can that's very well documented. They, Holyfield would always. I mean, Holyfield was in a different weight category. He was cruiserweight. They had a very strong relationship for years. They were friends. And, yeah, absolutely. It's, right. it's okay. hard Listen, not to I be. Mean, when, I, I remember. Yeah. I remember when he lost to Buster Douglas. Holyfield was in the audience because Holyfield was supposed to be the real, the next fight, right? I, I and don't. Then, I, and I then don't he, recall, but, no, but, no, no, but I, I clearly remember it because the camera was just like. Yeah, but, you know, but, but but now now you're talking about when Holyfield became a heavyweight. But I'm talking about years, years before that. Okay, years right. before yeah. that, because he, he Holyfield was, supposed to was fight. a cruiserweight okay. and was I, not in contention to fight Mike Tyson. Holyfield's really tall, so I guess he was just skinny and tall during well, that time. He was a cruiserweight. It was a different weight class. Well, he wasn't cruiserweight heavy. is what weight? It's like two hundred, like one ninety something. Oh, okay. you know. Remember, gun. So Holyfield bulked up later. Yeah. So, um, so, but on paper, to me, he actually is similar to the Michael Spinks situation. Um, kind of blown up heavyweight, lighter. Mike Tyson had a lot of advantages over that body type, you know, and fighting people who were much bigger. To me, again, it's my opinion, it, it was a psychological uh, component and an obstacle for Mike Tyson. I have reasons to believe that, you know, uh, because of the past and the way that Holyfield uh, presented himself and everything. And, I, and you know, uh, but yeah, so... Again, if they fought again, I think it's it'd be the psychological component uh, that well, would be the obstacle. Yeah, I mean, Mike and Roy Jones had never fought before. Mm -hmm. Roy was a lower weight. Yeah, yeah. Was it one sixty eight? Yeah, which was yeah. like, is that a middleweight? No, it's super middleweight. Super middleweight. The right. same thing that uh, that Canelo is. Right? Exactly. Right. So they're always very different in size. So when they got in the ring for the first time, whatever, a couple of years ago, it was like, all right, this is their first fight. Mm -hmm. You know, no one really thought that Roy Jones was going to, you know, perform mm -hmm. all that well compared to Mike. I actually did. I thought, did he was, I thought Roy was going to be, you know, as slick and move around a lot more. Yeah. that, 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 that but, but, you know, Roy is a bigger Roy now, so you yeah. can't expect him to yeah, fight he, like he, he got big did Roy. when he was lighter. Yeah, big yeah. boy Roy now coming in there with a little bit extra gut. Yeah, but, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but in, in, another cat that, you know, for, you know, was, uh, fortunate to be around and train with is, uh, is uh, James Tony. Okay. James Tony, because of his slickness, right, he gained, uh, he came and he fought in heavyweight and pretty much destroyed Holyfield. It's just, you know, styles make fights. Yeah. So James, James is one of the slickest. I love stuff that I, you know, being around in his fight camp, like seeing him do the little intricate in, in fighting that he does, and how slick he is as a, as a you know super middleweight and heavyweight. Because uh, you know, you know, you know, Frankie Lyles was my best friend, mm -hmm. so I always was in the same fight camps and you know trained with him for for years and was right around and watching him all spar and jumping in there myself so uh you know it, it's it's that style thing um frankie famously beat and knocked out roy jones early on uh and they all were in that same cut the same category yeah so it's interesting watching people come up with their skills as they get a, a higher weight class well yeah i mean with holyfield tyson Eliminated himself in the first fight by biting his ear twice. Mm -hmm. 
And then in the second fight. Of course, to my to my argument, that had to be a psychological component, would you think? Yeah, that was just crazy. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I remember watching this with my friends, and like all of us were looking at each other, like, what the hell just happened? Yeah. I you know, like the the ear biting thing had never I had never witnessed it before or after. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Like literally, that was such a unique. Really, in any sport, I've never seen anything quite like this. Right. Like, like, <laughs> are you saying that biting you haven't off seen a, a body a part being bitten off in any other sport? No, <laughs> not an ear, not a of nose. Not. I yeah, mean, yeah. listen, as violent as, as hockey is, you don't see yeah. weird shit like that happen. People just punch each other. You but, know. But you, but you know, I was the happiest person on the planet when I saw that. Why is that? I told. I think I told you this before. I think you did because I I had to play Mike Tyson, right? Right. In the movie, and that's what I played because. I understood because that was me. Hmm. I had that kind of temper. Yeah. That like I couldn't, I, you know, it was rabbit, right? So you would bite but, a ear? I, I you know, I I I, I had never bit a ear before. No, no, okay. but I Just had checking. the worst temper that I've checking. ever seen uh, on anybody okay. growing up. And so I felt like Tyson was that same way. And what that's what I played in the movie, right? And a lot of people knocked me saying, that, oh, you know, Tyson's friend said, I'd never seen him behave like that. Because at that time, no footage existed of him going berserk like that. Mm. So I had to go out of my spirit and go, no, nah, this is what I think it is. And so when I saw that happen in the ring, I'm sitting there going, I told you. Okay, <laughs> there it is. That's what I was playing. That's what I was playing because I knew it too well because, you know, I, not many of us have that kind of uh, volatility, you know? And luckily, I grew out of it uh, to some degree, you know? To I, some I, degree. Well, I think, I think I'm pretty much... <laughs> I, I think it's there for, you know, just to you know, save the family or right. fight ninjas or something. Yeah, got it's got like, the stash. I got, yeah, you I got, got in the, the, stash, in, just in the back pocket somewhere. You know? Well, uh, Jake Paul versus Nate Diaz. Mm. Uh, it's set for August 5th, but there was that whole fight that just happened with Nate Diaz. You heard about this? No. no yeah, this bad. brawl happened where he he choked out a man during a street brawl. The guy actually sort of looked like Jake Paul a little bit. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's a, a little bit unsure if it's still going to happen. Why would that make anybody unsure? Why would that halt anything? I don't get it. I guess, yeah, you're right. I mean, if he gets Isn't arrested. Isn't that a Wednesday it's, it's for that not, guy? Yeah, it's not like uh, he's going to get 20 years for something like this. But then again, you, well, you never know. You never know. I mean, depending on how severe the injuries are, he might actually end up going to prison. Needing the fight to to pay off. Well, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm going to say. Well, anyways, yeah. regardless of this whole fight that happened, because like I said, there is an arrest warrant for Nate right now. But That's a shame. Jake Paul versus Nate Diaz. How do you how do you see this working out? Hmm. Hey, interesting, because you know Jake. Jake is. I, I don't go. I don't go into uh, into Jake Paul fights and doubting him too much. I know he's got a hell of a, a left, um, and and Nate gets hit. So there is that interesting balance. Uh, Nate's not the fastest cat, but he's efficient and he's got a hell of a gas tank. But again, one of great one of Nate's greatest weapons is his is his durability and his uh, jujitsu, which, which is do. not going to be on the table. Right, because uh, Jake Paul's four and zero against MMA fighters. Right, but he just lost to Tommy Fury. Which is not an MMA fighter. She's not an MMA fighter. That's a boxer. What I was saying. I said if he has a if he fights a a boxer that's you know commensurate, then it's a little different. You know, I didn't expect him to win that against. Oh, another so boxer. you you thought that he was going to lose against Tommy? Yeah, I think it was on this show. As I mentioned it. Put him in the ring with a real twenty-something year old who really boxes, who's not an MMA guy. Once again. Do you think that Jake Paul could continue this, this of course, reign? Of course not. I- okay. So you thought he was going to lose, mm-hmm. which you predicted. What's your prediction with Nate Diaz if it happens? I don't have a prediction with that. It, it kind of balances. I, f- I feel like it's, I, I don't, I, I don't know. I mean, that's one of the, that, that I, that I think it's a good choice because 
there are things that counterbalance themselves. Right. Yeah. And see, I was right. Uh, KSI, you know who that is? Mm-mm. He's like a uh, like a YouTuber. Yeah. He is basically the backup right now to Nate Diaz in case Nate Diaz isn't isn't going to fight. Okay. So so you got and I believe did they already fight before? I think it, it's it's a weird situation. It, it's a weird situation. I, I would like I really would Jake like Jake to actually start fighting real boxers. I feel like all these little gimmicky fights with older MMA fighters. I understand it looks good on his record, but. I don't feel like these are real fights. Yeah, there, there's. You know, the, I mean, Nate the, is thirty eight. Yeah, there, there's the, the the fights that people want to see, and uh, you know, I know a lot of people would like to see him fight uh, boxers, like like professional boxers. I don't think that would be interesting. Why? Because he would lose. Yeah. <laughs> For, plain and simple. Yeah. I mean, this is this is show business, and he's picked fights that made it interesting. I, I, I applaud him for it. Because, right. I mean, because it's brilliant. It's brilliant. You, you're going to fight somebody like Anderson Silva, and he won. And fight, I, I think it's just, yeah, I mean, of course. There's people who want to see me fight somebody. Well, you know, I'm like, okay, yeah, that's well, what I would do. A, I'm a, okay, you know, hold on, hold yeah. on. Like, like Jake's, like, you're a, you're a full-time actor mm-hmm. that, that does... You know, MMA it, 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 in, in it, your in your free time because that's your passion and everything yeah. else like that. Jake's primarily primary job right now is a boxer. Right. Right? That's his full time job. Yeah. The others, whatever he does on the side, but but he doesn't even do YouTube anymore. But, I don't but, think. but my, my my point being is that people is what people want to see. People no, want to see people it. want me to teach them karate. No, I got <laughs> you know, it. No, listen, but I'm I got saying, it. I like got people it. are going to want to see that. But that I don't know if they really know that they want to say because a lot of people, the the it's it's being driven by the spectators who don't really know what a liver shot feels like or <laughs> what it's what it is. And or they don't understand the weight differential. Of course, again, famously, oh, Bruce Lee could beat everybody. <laughs> they're supposed to think that way. Ah, uh, yes, this you conversation. Know what I'm yeah. it, it's it's they're supposed to think that that Seagal can beat up everybody. Great. That's 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 what you're supposed to think. There's a lot of uh, ingenuity going into making you feel that way. That's why you buy tickets. So what people want, um, yeah, yeah, they want to see Jake fight a, a major contender, boxing contender. It's not it's not fair. It, it it's but it's like almost like. If I was a really good friend of Jake, I wouldn't be saying this stuff because it's kind of showing what's behind the curtain in, in, in Oz. Mm-hmm. But he's got he, he's he's doing a good job with selling these shows because there's that what if. And I think this thing with with um, Nate Diaz is another brilliant move because there's a what if because there's a what if. I mean, Nate could beat him or he could knock Nate out. Mm-hmm. Great fight. That's what you want to do. That's that's what you know. That's, that's what yeah, famously I mean, listen, yeah, he's Don made, King and everybody yeah. else has done. You you got to you got to sell. Oh yeah, you got to sell that this Buster Douglas might beat Mike Tyson. You got to sell that. The fact that it happened was like oh shit, it actually happened, but it doesn't happen very often. So you just got to you got to be Ringling Brothers. You got to yeah. sell it. Yeah, I mean, listen, he's worth three hundred million right now. There you go. So, you know, at if, the he, end of if day, he was fighting legitimate boxers, no, he wouldn't. He would not be worth yeah, that. You feel me? he keep yeah. losing o- over and over again, yeah, like yeah. Tommy Fury. Yeah. Well, uh, you mentioned Steven Seagal. Uh, one of my YouTube members, uh, Pedro Ramirez, he actually uh, referred to a interview that Steven Seagal did where you got mentioned. Oh, God. And I never watched this until, until this morning. Yeah, yeah. So I guess the interviewer said uh, he asked Steven – if he thought that Michael Jai White is a tough guy. Yeah. And Steven's response was, can I laugh in your face? Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Do I think uh, Michael Jai White is a tough guy? No. Do I think mm-hmm. he's a martial artist? No. No, <laughs> right, yeah. What did you, you think when you saw that? I, he, he, I felt like Steven embarrassed himself. Mm. Because, I mean, Steven hired me three different times himself. Why? If I'm not a good martial artist. And... and 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 then uh, he, you know he hired me for the Nissan Soup uh, ads for for Japan, and I was a choreographer and everything else. 
Hire me for On Deadly Ground, which is a movie he directed, right? Hire me personally. Offer me a role that I didn't really take because I thought it was it was silly. Um, and then, of course, I'm, I'm in the movie with him in um, Exit Wounds. Um, I never had really anything against him other than, you know, he, he, you know, famously I talked about what he does with, um, you know, with the, with the stunt guys. But it's, it's, it's ironic that Stephen would not call me a martial artist because, I mean, it's like, well, when you think of martial arts, you think of uh, being healthy, humble, uh, you know, respectful, uh, you know, discipline, all that, all of that stuff that all has Steven Seagal written all over it, does it not? That's a healthy, humble, respectful guy, would you think? Hmm. No, I don't think anybody would say that they would yeah, attribute they, that. Not so, at least, yeah. So, 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 it's at least. I, so it's ironic that he would, he would say that, but he apologized to me face to face in in um in Thailand when we ran it, into each other. Oh, how long ago was this? Uh when I was shooting um uh uh triple threat. Which is what year? I don't know. Well, that, that was recently though, a few years ago, right? Yes, quite quite a few years ago. Yeah. But but in and he said that basically that it was because of Michael Chavello, who was the interviewer, and he said some pretty direct derogatory things. Wait, he's gonna blame the interviewer on I, I, trash I, I talking even, you. I, I hate what, people. What, what people he, always blame me for this shit. What, what, like, come what, on, really? What, I made you say all that. What I he made said, you say all I, that. I won't even. I won't even. Um, he knows if he ever looks at his interview. If I said what he said, that that would cause him a lot of a lot of uh, problems with, you know, with a a, a group that he is a part of that's you know he said some very anti-semitic things really yes huh I yeah know that. so so but well, what i won't even no, i'm not gonna, gonna say you can tell me off a man camera. i was like he knows what he said okay so, right because so, isn't he basically hiding in russia over a bunch of charges this that he is got? what i've heard right well i mean i remember i interviewed claudia jordan who said that he essentially tried to rape her she had like run out of the house mm. i remember this i don't think this part of the interview came out but I remember this part of our interview. I remember this conversation. I think at the time we were a little worried that this might cause some some legal problems, so we never put it out. But at this point, it's all pretty much out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she she said flat out that he tried to to sexually assault her, and she had to like she basically had to run out of the house. Yeah, and I mean, why else would be living in Russia right now? I mean, seriously, I don't know. I mean, seriously, I, I, yeah, you know, and and it's it's I can't I can't even wish ill of the guy because he's he's brought a lot of this stuff on himself. And I think it's due to his martial arts principles, or lack thereof, which is, you know, it's, I, it's irony. Because I, I think everybody should be humble, especially that gentleman we're speaking of. Because, I mean, when you look at it, if you think about the reality of situations, the reality uh, versus um, image, uh, I always try to educate people with... Um, because, you know, I mean, of course, I benefit from what I do. And people believe that, oh, yeah, you know, you're a martial artist. So you, you do that and you could beat every. I just go, don't let your eyes deceive you. Um, in a way, I look at Steve Zagal as a modern day David Carradine that kind of has a little bit of a, a you know, a, a delusions of grandeur. <laughs> <laughs> because what it is is that just like David Carradine, it's the it's the other guys that make you look good, right? It's the other, it's the ukis, which is the guys that you're throwing around that make you look wonderful. I I say this, and I I'll, I'll, I'll put out a challenge. See if Steven Seagal is doing anything physically in a movie that your dad can't do, right? And 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 see if you go okay. You do, you have your dad do the same physical movements and see if, it, if that can be done or not. Now, you can't do that with Ms. Scott Atkins. Your dad can't do that. You're, you can't, you know, with Jean-Claude Van Damme, go ahead, get your dad to kick that high and do what. But with Steven Seagal, which I think he should be humble, you're not doing anything that other people can't do physically, right? But 
the persona is bigger than life. And I applaud it. I, I was a fan. But it's like, it is what it is. Uh, and so, again, for people who, if you really want to take a microscope to it, you go, wow, okay, um, there's something to be learned there. There's The images are huge. Images are powerful. And how, so, how the image is projected makes you believe that this person is exalted or whatever. But I go, hey, this is a new day and age. Well, you could look at things and not, not look at, study the choreography. Great choreographer. He was a great choreographer before he did anything in, on film. He choreographed the challenge. He choreographed uh, like this, this Shogun stuff. He was a great choreographer. But it's co good choreography can make you believe that somebody has abilities that they don't have. And just, just so as an educator, as a martial artist, I go, okay, take a look. And you see where I, I think nobody has a right to have such an inflated ego, especially when people can do what you do. Yeah, I don't know if you saw this one interview where a guy like was interviewing him like in front of his hotel and mm -hmm. he like pushed the guy into like a pond. You saw that? No, no, no. But yeah, I, the guy was basically, I mean, you could tell that Steven was a little bit annoyed, I guess, at the interview. And, and, and he was like, oh, just last question, you know, how do you achieve Zen? And Seagal just pushed him into like this little pond. <laughs> That, that sounds hilarious. I it was a little funny. That but sounds hilarious. It was also some asshole type shit. Like. But, because there's part of me, that I think I said it before, Steven Seagal could be the one of the funniest action comedy people on the planet if he didn't take himself too serious. You know, because if you think about that same guy as the lead in the new Naked Gun, it's freaking hysterical. If he mm. behaved the same way, but it's all okay. kinds of crazy shit going right. on. Yeah, just sure, that yeah. dude would have a whole new career. It, it, I think it'd be hilarious. You could bring OJ back too. Like, no, Steven Seagal no, no, no. and OJ Simpson and Naked Gun <laughs> 7 or whatever. Oh my God. <laughs> that would be, that would be, that would get us canceled. Yeah, that would get us canceled. Get us canceled. Yeah. 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 But I mean, no, but, but it, it yeah, in my imagination, I, that movie makes me laugh my ass off. Well, the WWE and the UFC are actually merging into a $21 billion company. Okay. That's kind of crazy. I don't know what that means. Though. I'm not sure what it means either, but I guess it's just two huge entertainment companies that are now becoming one. And I guess, because it's interesting how a lot of UFC fighters have gone to the WWE. That's natural. Ken Shamrock, who I interviewed, and he basically said that he's hurt himself worse than WWE than he did in the UFC. Pro wrestling is where I get more damage. I got more damage. MMA is an area where I was good, right? So when I went into a fight, I could finish a guy in a minute, two minutes, and on to the next. Uh, even when I had tough fights, I was good enough not to take damage because I'd take them down. I didn't get into the, the, the slug batches with people. I took them down, worked the submission game, less damage. When I went into a pro wrestling ring, I had to give them my body. Like, it wasn't like I could defend myself and stop them from slamming me. They're going to slam me because that's part of the program. Yeah, 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 I can imagine. And that. I've heard this a lot. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, like guys like New Jack messed himself up real bad. Rest in peace. He, he mm. passed away, I think, since our last interview. Um, I just interviewed Jake the Snake. He was completely oh, tore yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. yeah man. I got good friends, um, really good friends. This is one of my best friends in the world. Is Ernest Miller, Ernest the Cat Miller, mm -hmm. and you know I I know firsthand with uh, well not firsthand but through him uh, that that lifestyle and the bumps that they have to take, man they have to they, they have to present their bodies uh, they they can't really protect themselves in right. a lot of ways. Yeah, Logan Paul got hurt really bad I think doing WWE recently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Brock Lesnar, uh, Ronda Rousey, like a lot of people have. Had a lot of success. I mean, Ken Shamrock went back and forth, I think. He was yeah, UFC, yeah. WWE, back to the UFC, and so forth. I mean, listen, I understand there's a lot of money in the WWE. Yeah. I'm not really a big wrestling fan like that. I've never quite gotten the whole gist of it. Mm -hmm. But I get it. It's big checks, but you have to really pay for that. Like I remember interviewing um, Jake the Snake. He was basically saying how 
at his prime, he had to work like seven days a week. Mm -hmm. And if he said he needed a break, you know, they would be like, okay, next, Who, who's the next guy in? Yeah, but, but you yet, know, if you're in MMA, you only do it what, once, twice a year? Yeah. In wrestling, you're doing it seven days a week. That's right. You know, and everyone's expected to take steroids. You know, everyone's expected to be huge and perfectly yeah. fit and, you know, and so forth and constantly be on tour. Yeah, I mean, listen, I'm I'm glad I never got into WWE. Like, th that seems, I understand that you could make a lot of money and there's some fame, but it just seems like everyone walks away just completely messed up. Yeah. I mean, uh, I... I my heart goes out to people like that, that. Like I said, that's our modern day gladiators, or the UFC guys, fighters, mm -hmm. even, you know, the, the wrestlers, you know, we live vicariously through them. They're heroes until they're not. And that, that it saddens me that people are not uh, taking care of them later. That's why, that's why, like, I always try to cast uh, fighters in my, my movies. And, yeah. You know, even with, with Ernest, what I was just telling you, I mean, he's, he his first movie was in well he was in Blood and Bone, mm -hmm. and you know I and I was instrumental in getting him uh, that key role in the wrestler with Mickey Rourke, and he played Mickey Rourke's uh, nemesis in that movie. But I'm I'm you know I'm, but I've known Ernest since man since the late '80s where we trained together way back then. But yeah, that's that's a harsh lifestyle, uh, and it's unforgiving. Yeah, yeah, it, it, you know, I, I even watched this series, uh, Dark Side of the Ring. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've watched a bunch of them. Yeah, yeah, it, it's it's something. It's something. Well, speaking of UFC, John Bones Jones. Mm -hmm. Since our last interview, uh, won his debut as a heavyweight. Uh, we beat uh, Cyril Gan. Yeah. Would you say at this point? That Jones is the greatest MMA fighter of all time. I said that a long time ago. You've been ago. saying that. Okay. Yeah, I said that a long time ago. <laughs> there's no excuse. There's no, there's no kind of argument against that. If people want to hate, oh, the PEDs. Yeah, the PEDs make you like have good timing. And if no, I'm sorry, they don't. And a lot of people did those PEDs. And and then I think he was exonerated for, for a lot of that anyway, because of um the stringent level. Uh, the testing levels or whatever, but mm. you know, I don't want to go into that, but he, he, but yeah, John has been, and I think it's going to, I don't know who's going to beat him. I feel like Cyril Gan had the skills to be his hardest fight. Mm. And you see how that, that turned out. Cause I mean, John grabbed somebody, forget <laughs> it, forget yeah. it. Well, he's also I, I try, like, I uh, try to grapple with that dude. Oh yeah. yeah you guys, yeah. You, you yeah. Guys, uh, he's like you guys trying fought. to uproot a tree. Well, yeah, I mean, because he has such an odd build. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like these giant long arms and legs. Yeah. It's sort of like, you know, you know, almost like a Michael Phelps in swimming. Like he just has a natural biological advantage over everyone else because he was just born. But this different. is the thing. Just like with Floyd Mayweather, he's way ahead of it. You know how calm he is in the ring? Like he... he from the first time I saw him, I swear, my, my wife was watching with me. I was like, nobody's beating that guy. Because I just saw how calm he was and how he would see the openings. You know, so, so many times I go, well, why, why, are, why are people throwing against where the, the arms are? Why aren't they seeing this? And John would see the same things. He would see things from different angles. And he moved with a natural... Ability. That's why I wanted to train and spar against him more than anybody. Because I was like, that guy is another level. And my whole thing is, I want to spar with people who are better than me, right? So I get better. But I knew from, from day one, I'm like, nobody, he's got all the components. And now in heavyweight, I don't see anybody, I think it's going to be easier for him at heavyweight. Huh? Is that yeah. more of his natural weight? Yes, it is. Yeah. I mean, he walks around at 230, 235. Yeah, because how tall is he? Like, like six, six four. Six four. Yeah, and and that's his skeleton. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's yeah. his natural skeleton. Is, is, is that is a heavyweight skeleton? So he doesn't. You know, you might be impressed by somebody being muscular or whatever, but no, no, no. That's not the truth. You're fighting somebody's skeleton. So 
Look at that. Look at that bone structure against somebody else's bone structure. So th- bones are are dense. It's not muscle. You know. We had uh, Keefe D on here uh, recently, and uh, you know this is the guy that was in the car yeah. that was involved in the shooting of Tupac. Uh, he said, uh, and I, I, you know, I've always heard the stories of you know Suge Knight getting beat up and stuff like that. There was a few ones that mm-hmm. were actually, you know, you saw the pictures and everything else like that. But apparently he said that, you know, before social media and everything else like that, he saw an altercation where he saw Suge Knight and his bodyguard get beat up by a guy who knew karate. I was on the other side of, of the room, but uh, shit, that boy Bruce Richardson beat their ass. You know what I'm saying? I guess he knew karate? Yeah, yeah. Bad <laughs> motherfucker, he beat their ass, beat both of their ass. Mm. So, you know what I'm saying? It's kind of like, well, okay, that, 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 that kind of makes sense. Like, make here's sense, someone yeah. who actually knows their way around. They're mm. not just swinging on you. They actually know. But yeah, he said, like, this dude just just beat the crap out of him. Yeah, it is an unfair advantage because, I mean, you've been, I mean, most people don't know how to block a kick to the face. Or, right. <laughs> no, they don't know how to do that. I mean, I've, yeah, had, that's true. I've had street fights where it's just like, you sh- yeah, it's, it's, it's a whole different thing. Yeah. And people just have no idea what they're dealing with. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I think Suge definitely got by with his size and weight and also everyone he has with him. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? See, Suge is, what, six something. He's like 300 something pounds. And, you know, yeah, he'll slap look- you and he got 20 guys with you and, mm. to prevent you from doing anything back. Big guys, a lot of times, it, it's false sense of security. You're a big ass target. That, that <laughs> I mean, really, you're a big yeah, target. And if true. I'm hitting a big you can't get out of the way fast enough and it's going to destroy you once it hits you you know that's that's kind of like when you see this stuff in heavyweight like like when i'm talking about john jones how's he going to miss that big guy and when he strikes he knows how to strike he knows how to hit hard so yeah it against somebody who really knows how to fight big guys should stay away from getting uh, Mm. unless they really know how to block or counter but I've seen hilarious fights with big dudes who felt confident about fighting. They get tired very fast. Yeah. And, you know, because I had a lot of students who were big, muscular guys who just, like, they're, they're, they're worthless fighting. It's, it's hilarious when they have, a, a, you know, the confidence that they can kick ass. It's like, uh, <laughs> where'd you get that from, you know? Yeah, probably by manhandling people. You know, or or so scaring forth. people. Scaring people. It's scaring people. But, but once you get, I mean, listen, I've, I've boxed before. I know getting in a ring is hard. Yeah. It is hard. Not only are you trying not to get hit, but you're also, you know, trying to work on, you know, your, your form and everything else like that. And as you're, 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 every, you know, and the clock is ticking and there's no one there to save you. And, you yeah. know, I mean, listen, I, yeah. I remember getting hit with an uppercut and it was just like, uh, just staring at the ceiling for a second. You're like, how did yeah. I get here? And, yeah. Yeah. And just like, you know, a lot of big guys, like you just, if you know how to slip punches, you get them tired and it's like, and, and watch the, 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 you know, it occur in their mind. You're tired now. You know, they're tired and you, oh, yeah. you're just like completely fresh. I mean, that's, Ali, a, that's uh, a bad feeling. Yeah. Ali and Foreman. Mm-hmm. The Rumble in the Jungle, yeah. where he just basically let Foreman just keep punching him, keep punching him, punching him, and then just bat, 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 bat. Yeah, because uh, Ali was just as big as Foreman. People, people yeah, yeah. Psychologically, exactly. you know, they were four pounds different. Exactly. And the, the, the day of the weigh-in beforehand. Uh-huh. So Ali could have been heavier than Foreman that day. Could be. Yeah, and um, uh, rest assured, his legs were bigger, mm-hmm. and that's where your power is coming from. And he's moving faster at, at, at the same weight. So yeah. it's psychological. It's like, whoa, you, you think you're a big guy, but, uh, you know, you're a big-ass target. Did you see the fight where uh, Takashi 6 9 got jumped? No, I don't even know who that is. Takashi 6 9 the guy who snitched on everybody? No, with the face tattoos? I, no you idea. See, you want to see my birth certificate? Yeah, okay, I'm old. Okay. I got you. Yeah. <laughs> Before, no idea I, who that I, is. I, 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 I think... I, it was a guy with colorful yes. stuff. The, the in rainbow his hair. hair and right, that guy. People want to kill him. I, yeah, well, um, he, he told on everyone that he was in a uh, LA fitness in Florida by himself with no security. And a couple of uh, these Latin King dudes basically came in and just beat the crap out of him in the bathroom and recorded it. And now they got arrested. Well, that, that sounds interesting. This is one of the things that, 
you know, for I don't know the guy, but you know, imagining the guy whose image I think I've seen in an LA fitness and then gangsters in an LA fitness, like beating them up to the 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 Muzak. <laughs> in the background to me it's hilarious i got a warped sense of humor yeah but i'm thinking about you know like the carpenters are playing while they beat the mm -hmm. shit out of this guy it's it's kind of funny to me well do you hear about what happened to Praz or the fujis i do know who that is i'm old enough uh that's the guy that goes one time no that's actually wyclef you're Wy close though i thought wyclef said that wyclef says one time Two times, yeah, that's Wyclef. Then what the hell does Prize do? Uh, if he yeah, doesn't, uh, if he's not the guy that went one time, no, he was on the songs. Though. Was he I mean, playing a tambourine? What the he fuck? was not playing a tambourine. He was one of the rappers in the group. There was two guys and a girl. There's Wyclef, yeah, yeah, Lauren yeah. Hill, and Proswell. Yeah, Proz. Well, here's what happened though. I mean, the group broke up many moons ago. Yeah. Uh, Praz had a little bit of, of a solo career. He had a song called uh, Ghetto Superstar with Maya and Old Dirty Bastard, which did a little something. But really, okay, for, a, that one. for many, you know, for the last, I mean, that came out in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. So for 20 years, he really hasn't been doing anything music-wise. Okay. So what happened was the, the Malaysian businessman, Joe Lowe, the guy who stole $4 billion from the Malaysian government. Sure, that was, guy essentially funneling money through Praz for political things. Joe Lowe was the one who financed Wolf of Wall Street. He paid for, for that movie. He gave mm -hmm. uh, Leonardo DiCaprio a Picasso as payment, which Leonardo had to give back <laughs> eventually. So he stole billions of dollars, billions, and he was running this money, part of the money through Praz. Like he was basically trying to get the Trump administration. Well, he was, he first started with the Obama administration. He gained like, I think like 10 million, tried to get a photo with Obama. Obama didn't want to do it. Uh, he then tried to get the Trump administration, try to like drop the charges against him. He was also trying to favor, he was, he was trying to get this Chinese businessman that was wanted by China, extradited back to China. So he was trying to kind of curry some favor with China in the process. And it all came crashing down recently. Okay, Netflix, did you hear that? This is, this is your new series. This is a new series. It's about three-parter. It's about, three oh, it about, about a ten-parter. Yeah. The crazy part about this was that I believe he gave Praz like, like $200 million or something, $100 million, $200 million, like a huge amount of money. And Praz had the opportunity to basically give back most of that money and not face any criminal charges, but he tried to fight it. He didn't want to take the plea deal. He didn't want to give the money back. So at the point that he refused the plea deal, a superseding federal indictment came down with 10 criminal charges. And Praz just lost on all 10 counts. Okay. Facing 20 years now. Okay. And that, that I just watched a Netflix series just, <laughs> just, just now. That's interesting. It, it's, it's pretty wild, man. It's pretty well. And I know Praz. I've interviewed him twice. In fact, my I met first, him a few times. You met him. Okay. Yeah. yeah cool yeah. guy. Listen, he pulled up to my house. I mean, I, I interviewed him once in my studio. And then I remember he came to my house in Calabasas. Then, you know, he pulled up in the Rolls Royce Phantom. You know, I went to his his place and um, I think I interviewed him at his house in uh, Beverly Hills at his, at his apartment, you know. And like, he was basically living a lifestyle. It's crazy to me that you know that money is stolen. You know you shouldn't have that money. And yet you're still trying to hold on to it, knowing it's not yours, knowing it's, it's fraudulent. Because the guy who's really being charged, the, the Malaysian guy, mm -hmm. is missing. Oh, okay. It gets even more interesting. See you know what I'm saying? Okay. He's hiding in China somewhere is what they say. But I'm saying like it was a trial for both of them, but only one of them showed up. Hmm. And, you know, Praz took the stand, tried to defend himself, saying that, you know, he had no idea, whatever, whatever, but the, the jury saw through it, and ultimately he's facing 20 years. Uh, it's it's crazy. And, you know, I mean, I, I talked to him, and uh, I remember he was even telling me, like, oh, because I, I told him, I'm like, because, you know, he was trying to borrow money from me, like, last year to help pay for his lawyers, and I'm like, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not getting wrapped up in this. Okay. But I was like, 
well, what's going on? Are you facing any prison times? Oh, no, no, no. There's no prison time. It's just a matter of how much money, you know, that they're trying to take. And I'm thinking like, man, I would give them whatever money they wanted. <laughs> Y'all could have that shit. Because prize is like 50. Okay. I want to get out of 70? The fuck? I'm good. Take it all back. I'll go do some shows. I'll make it, uh, I'll, you know, I could go support myself. You know, but yeah, yeah. facing 20 years. Pras from the Fugees. They were supposed to do like a concert, like a tour, and that got canceled. You should just sell this damn story. Make it off. Of I mean, that. it's public now. They don't even need them to sell it. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just out of, out of touch because I didn't, I didn't know anything. About, I mean, I've been, I've been working, I've been gone, you know, playing make believe. Yeah, you know, doing movies and stuff. Well, a little closer to home with you is um, the whole Jonathan Major situation. Mm. Now you follow that. I've heard about. Uh, okay. I got some smatterings of just Jonathan Major. Smatterings. Have yeah. you ever met him? No, I haven't. I haven't either. No. But I would say at this very moment, Jonathan Majors, I would say, is the hottest up and coming actor in Hollywood right now. I would think so. Yeah. I can't think of anyone else on on the trajectory of a Jonathan Majors. Nope, me neither. See what I'm saying? Me, me neither. You know, uh, Michael B. Jordan is definitely up there as well, but I feel like Michael B. Jordan is sort of settling into sort of his role, whereas Jonathan is still well, going. Jonathan Majors, major league, like, yes. like he just came like like a comet. Yeah, I mean, not only did he co-star in, in Creed three, but he is Kang the Conqueror in the Marvel mm -hmm. universe, mm -hmm. and he's got a bunch of movies sort of centered around him and yeah. his character. So the story is, is that he was in his, uh, they were in a taxi, him and his girlfriend, and apparently his girlfriend saw that some other girls were texting him on his phone, mm -hmm. and she went crazy, and something happened where, I don't know whether he was defending himself, or maybe he put hands on her, but she got hurt in the process. And then she pressed charges, and his whole world changed that day. Yeah, I, I like I really didn't investigate this for myself. I just keep getting things from my wife, and you know, just uh, you know, I heard that he was going to be exonerated because it really wasn't what people thought, and then it's like, oh no, no, it's 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 something, and I, yeah, she and just got a restraining order for him, and. What bat, what makes matters a lot worse was that a bunch of other women have now come forward mm. with other abuse allegations and they're cooperating with the district attorney. Oh, boy. Yeah. So everyone at this point, he got dropped by his management, which is a big deal. Yeah, I heard that. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, to, for your management, for management to drop someone of this caliber and the amount of money they would make off of him meant that, oh, okay, we just... The, the loss, yeah, the, the, the losses we'll get from this affiliation doesn't match up to the gains we'll get from taking a percentage of his of his earnings. Yeah, yeah. He got dropped by his PR. That's not really a big deal. PR companies, you know, people mm. rotate PR companies, whatever. But the management company was a big deal. And right now, essentially, everyone's waiting to see what Disney will do. Because that's really like the make it or break it. If Disney announces that they we're no longer going forward with this contract with him and all these movies that are slated to start filming, I think that's going to be like the nail in the coffin. That's going to be a long, slow road back to try to, to try to get back to, you know, Hollywood's good graces. You know, I, I, I wonder what the real story is, like what the whole thing. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I just, I just don't know. Uh, I just know it's, it's, it sounds pretty damn tragic, but yeah, if there was credence behind it, then you know, things kind of balance out. I uh, just don't know. I mean, look, I, I think he was actually the one that made the 911 call. I think that the, the situation has got out of hand and maybe, yeah. you know, he's obviously a big, strong guy, and this is a little a little girl, like, you know, not a little girl, but, you know, a typical petite female, mm -hmm. and something happened where she got hurt, you know? I've always said that if a woman attacks you, you just gotta just take it. Hell, <laughs> you hell, know what I'm saying? Yeah, hell yeah. You can't really fight back as a man. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you, you, saw, you saw how they were crucifying, um, you know, uh, Dana White 
for like slapping his wife. Right, right. But if you watch the video, she she hits him first, mm. and he slaps her back. Yeah. Not to say it's justified either way, but everyone's always painting, oh, he slapped his wife. They're not talking True. about how he got assaulted first. Yeah, I mean, that's it, one of the things that we men have to just deal with. Just got to deal with you it. You know, shit, as if a, a woman, man, yeah, some to shit all that's the not going to be fair in your mind. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah, you no, just got to deal with that shit. Life is not fair. You yeah. know, you got to just look at societal norms we and get, just, you we know. We got a lot of other advantages. Yeah, we got a lot of other advantages. Yeah. So all yeah. the young men or, or older men who are watching this, if, if your woman attacks you, just take it. Okay, you won't mm -hmm. get hurt that bad. Unless she has right. a weapon of some sort. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Unless she pulls out a gun. Run. She ain't going to outrun you. She's not going to outrun you. She's run. not going to outbox you unless yeah. you're you're dealing with like a UFC fighter or mm -hmm. a, a woman bodybuilder or something of that sort. Like, not a bodybuilder ain't going to do nothing. You know? Not sure. <laughs> but, but yeah. But unless fighter. she pulls out a shotgun like that one girl. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anybody <laughs> pull out a shotgun. <laughs> yeah. You, you, you got, some, you got yeah. to go. But yeah, no, I'm, I'm just saying, if he would have just gotten, you know what I mean? I bet you something similar probably happened with the Chris Brown Rihanna situation. I had heard it was kind of like that. Like she saw something on his phone and she just mm -hmm. went ballistic, started hitting him, and he <laughs> retaliated. And then all you saw was that picture of her. It makes me think of Bill Burr's, uh, you know, what Bill Burr would say in this kind uh, of situation. You know, when he talks about, you know, there's no, there's no woman who ever got beaten up for shutting the hell up. <laughs> it was just. It's you know it's, it's funny because it's so you know jacked up to say, but um, but yeah, uh, yeah of course there's going to be reasons behind everything, but nothing trumps the fact that a man should never put his hands on a woman. Right. Period. 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 I, Period. I, and I I always been like this: if you were my best friend, don't ever tell me that you put your hands on a woman. Yeah. We gonna have problems. Yeah. We gonna have problems. You're my son. Don't ever tell me that you put your hands on. I had an issue with my my twenty seven year old son for speaking like because you could you could speak in a certain way that's abusive, and you know I had to talk to him about that. You know, uh, no, there's certain things that as men, no, you just don't do, or you ain't a man in my eyes. Uh, have you ever met Tyrese? Yeah, I've done two movies with him. See what's happening with him recently? I haven't. Well, he makes this long video. I guess what had happened leading up to this was, you know, uh, him and his ex-wife have been kind of going back and forth about uh, child support and whatever else. And I guess the judge uh, awarded her 10000 a month in child support. Okay. He does this whole video calling on Martin Luther King III and Benjamin Crump to join him on the steps of the Atlanta courthouse to protest unfair child support laws. The fact that he brought Martin Luther King <laughs> into this conversation, mm. I don't think MLK uh, fought for, you know, to lower child support payments. You know, I'm not that great at uh, history, uh, yeah, but I'm pretty either. sure think, yeah. he had a slightly more important role, mm, <laughs> important mm. goal that he was yeah. fighting for mm, yeah, <laughs> during yeah, his yeah. time. I'm sure he's... I don't remember that part of the speech. Yeah, you know? You know. <laughs> I had a dream. I don't think <laughs> included child support payments as, as part of the... <laughs> yeah, yeah. As part of that. And ultimately what happened was uh, he was held in contempt of court and now he has to pay $636,000 mm -hmm. for child support and uh, his ex-wife's lawyer's fees. Okay. To me, it's like, hey, Pookie said something that they didn't agree with, then Pookie's got to pay, you know, $300 to... It's the same thing to me. I mean, that man could could afford this. Yes. You know what I mean? I put everything all in the same context. I don't think 600000 is more than, you know, your, your cousin who has to pay $600 to whatever. So to me, it's like, okay, that's all. Like him paying $10,000 a month child support, 
okay. Yeah, I mean, to me, that's to a, me it's, it's not that big of a deal. How much you like, make. Oh, yeah, you know, you're so, doing your, I mean, bar- I mean, to me, it's based on your net worth. It's yeah. ba- based on your income. He does Fast and Furious movies. Hell yeah. You this know what I'm saying? He, he's, he's, a working, he's a working actor. He's going to constantly be like, working. To, to be sitting there and, and calling for a protest over your child support payments. and Benjamin Crump, like, like he... He gets involved when the police murder black men. Like you know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? He's not gonna involve he's not gonna involve himself in your child support <laughs> payments. Right. You see, it's just so to me, but but listen, I've I've communicated with Tyrese. We've DM'd each other before, and like Tyrese would leave me like these voice messages, you know, instead of typing, he would leave me mm-hmm. these voice messages. And after a while I had to just block him because I'm like, I'm I feel like I'm dealing with a crazy person right now. T- Tyrese is uh, as a lot of amazingly talented performers are it comes with something you know yeah it, you know he's he his emotional quotient is part of what makes him him it's not surprising that he would go all out this way because yeah. he's a passionate type of person yeah but i i go yeah that 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 makes sense for what i see of this artist and this this being you know Tyrese but i I I feel like okay. That's that's how how he feels. Well, you know, granted, and you put it in a different context. Yeah, it looks a little crazy, but um, you, you might embrace him for his craziness in other scenarios. So I think it goes goes in the you know yeah. the same thing. So I, I I don't see a big thing. I think the man can afford it. Right. I think if he if this is his heart. Go go do your thing. Remember, people gonna the people are always gonna come, gonna talk about you, you know. So yeah. and that's that's a good thing, you know. You're talked about. So yeah, I you mean, know, remember you keep that, living uh, for your your family and your friends and keep it moving. I mean, remember that video when he was like crying, that what more do you want from me? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, okay, I understand. I mean, if you're my little a, brother, I'm like, yo, don't do that, man. Don't do that. Don't do that. But 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 like. Yeah, I, I mean, look, like, listen, I've I've cried before. Mm-hmm. You know, my dad was dying. I was crying and everything mm-hmm. else like that. At no point did I think that I'm going to pick up my phone and record myself and post this on the internet. I, I just don't understand why you would take a, 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 a personal, like, heartbreaking, embarrassing moment, you know, embarrassing meaning that it's not embarrassing to, to the people around you, but to the world it's a bit embarrassing. You know what I'm saying? As a man, to be like, mm. I I would just never think to say, wow, I'm going to take this video and I'm going to post it to the world and become a meme for the rest of my life. Like, I, I just don't get it. But, you know, what I think, my this is my theory when it comes to this. I feel like when it comes to entertainment, a lot of times people get stuck at the moment that they sort of break through that however they break through, they get stuck in that moment. Yeah. I I say this all the time. Tyrese, the, the moment that he broke through in Hollywood entertainment was the movie baby boy. Right. Well, a little, a little earlier. What did he do before baby boy? Well, he had, he had done the uh, yeah, the, the Coca Cola commercial. Yeah, that and okay. yeah. Well, so yeah, his that was his first. Was that his first? That was his first starring role. Yeah, yeah, yeah you probably right. Probably it was a John right. Singleton yeah, yeah. film. Yeah, yeah, it was considered a classic, definitely mm-hmm. a hood classic, and I think a classic overall. Not to me, but anyway. no, yeah. I, I I mean, listen, people still quote it and stuff like that. I still see it. That movie pissed me off. <laughs> That's right. a different thing. But look, yeah, yeah. he played. I mean, that was the whole premise, right? He's a baby boy. Mm-hmm. He's mm-hmm. he's not, he's a grown man who still acts like a baby. Yeah, and they, that exists. And right, he's a grown man. A movie about that shit. with a child. Yeah, who's right. acting like the child. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, the movie starts off with him like an embryo, like as an adult. Like it pisses the- me off because it it makes us seem that that's that's the that's what our our people are like you know i mean there's yeah yeah there's the there's the lowest common dom- denominators but why do we have to always okay prop up those so, stories so all i'm saying is is that 
he got praise. He got the most amount of praise in his life for that that role. And I feel like he got stuck in that role to a certain degree for the rest of his life. That's what I think. Now, listen, I'm sure if me and him talked, he would say I'm full of shit, whatever. From my point of view, that's what it is. I equate that to Tupac. Tupac. Very much so. Tupac did Juice as Bishop. And I remember even like Biggie was saying when they ran into each other at the Soul Train Awards and guns got drawn and everything else like that, like Biggie was looking at this guy who he used to hang out with, that he was close friends with and everything else like that. And he's like, I'm not seeing Tupac. I'm seeing Bishop. Thank you. See, I mean, I've, I've been saying this. I said it a long time ago when people try to attack me. But now you think about everybody who speaks about Tupac. There's two, there's a dichotomy. There's two guys going on. Mm-hmm. All you got to do, please, please play the 17 year old Tupac, uh, the, the little, the, the interview. That, that, that's who he was. Yeah. He was this innocent, almost, dare I say, somewhat effeminate type of dude, right? Like when you really look at that, that interview, he was a very soft person. That's who he was. Two years later, he plays Bishop. And that character that he created with Bishop influenced millions of people. And he stayed in that character. Because yeah. I literally would see him flip-flop from one character to the other. Because we would hang out, we'd play pool. And famously, people would say, your friend looks like Tupac. <laughs> and they didn't think that could be him. Because he was more like that 17-year-old guy. And a lot of people that really knew him was like, yo, he's... because." Because I always speak the way I speak now. And so he felt very comfortable being that other side around me. That really playful, you know, clowny, kind of like silly type of guy who knows all the schoolhouse rock jangles, you know. And then would flip into a different mode around. It's kind of like like once he did that bishop role, that became a much more interesting character for him to play. And I always say it's like if Al Pacino played Scarface and then chose to stay as a Cuban drug lord to impress Cuban gangsters. Well, he could stay in that character if he wanted to. You know what I mean? Al could have done that. Completely. But when you're a young kid, that impressionable, and you get all of this accolades, for being that character, even gangsters, you know, look up to you and give you the, the, that's a fantasy for a young kid like that, who was saying, you know, oh, these guys call women the B word, the B word. He was saying this in their interviews. Mm. Two years later becomes Bishop, right? So, I mean, I just think this is a fascinating study of human be it was human behavior that people could could just you could just look at that yeah. and go wait a minute the Tupac that you've seen his biography is a guy who grew up tough his whole life that's not what he was simply that's not what he was he grew up poor his whole life yeah but you would think he grew up in the hood his whole life and you know good and damn well that that wasn't a scenario. Yeah, no, no. Because he after around that interview, different cities from Baltimore to Marin yeah, to New, after from, that interview, New York. When he's 17. Yeah. What, what, he's a background dancer for Digital Underground. Right. So, and then he gets cast in, as in Juice. Right. You know? So that it's fascinating when you just think about this imagery. It kind of connects with the Seagal thing. There's an image that somebody's presented. If you really pay attention, who are the real people? There's an imagery that most of our our rappers presented early on that when you look at it later, and the Snoops and Dr. Dre's and Ice Cubes and all these people, you go, wait a minute, is that the gangster that, that influenced me to become a gangster? You know what I mean? <laughs> that the gangster that influenced me. I, so, gangster. so you know, is yeah, yeah. So I, I look at it and go, hey, just you know, just kind of educate yourself and say, okay, there's imagery that that gets paid great deals of money, presenting themselves and influencing a whole generation 
of people yeah. to act other than what they are. Like, you know, so it's like it's encouraging these this kid from not picking up a book and picking up a gun. Yeah. You know, sadly, that's the truth. Man, look, I, I interviewed uh, Ayanna Jackson, who was the Tupac rape accuser. Okay. Right. And we went through this whole story. You know, after the interview came out, uh, I was in contact with uh, this guy, Man Man. He was Tupac's road manager and also the co defendant in that particular case. So I'm basically, you know, he's watching, you know, he watched the interview and then me, I'm talking to him and I'm sort of getting his side of the story because, you know, obviously Tupac's not alive. So this is one of the only people that I could actually right. kind of bounce the story off of to get the other side. And essentially, listen, the stories are going to differ a little bit, but essentially what happened was this girl, she met Tupac, you know, she was smitten by him, you know, they messed around on the dance floor, they 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 hung out a couple times, they had sex, and then she came over to his hotel room to see him, you know, they're in the room by themselves, and then, you know, the guys that were in there came in to have sex with her as well, mm -hmm. and he walked out of the room and left her, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I remember this story. You know, her story is going to be one way, his, you know, his story was like that she was with it. Her story was like, no, I, I wasn't with it. I was here to see him. And mm -hmm. some of these other guys are in here, like basically yeah. raping me. Mm -hmm. Right. He, but the story is consistent that, you know, when the guys came in the room, he walked out of the room, yeah. right. That he went into the, the living room of the hotel and went to sleep on the couch. Yeah. Now she woke him up screaming like, yo, these guys raped me. Like, how could you let this happen? How could you let this happen? How could you let this happen? Mm-hmm. And at that moment, I remember me and me and Man Man were talking about this. I said, if at that moment, if Tupac had said, oh my God, I can't believe this happened to you. Let's, let's go in the back and let me try to make this right. Let mm -hmm. me calm you down. Let me apologize. Let me kick those guys out. Let mm -hmm. me maybe, I don't know, take you out to lunch, take you shopping, right. do whatever it takes to just calm her down. I said, I said, if that had happened, would have every would all of this have gone away? And Man Man said, absolutely. Absolutely. But right, you know what actually brilliant. happened? He stayed in character, bro. He said, get this bitch out of here. That's what his exact words. Get this bitch out of here. He stayed in character. And they got that bitch out of there. And that bitch went downstairs and went to the police. Mm -hmm. And his whole life changed at that point. He got convicted. He went to prison. Then from there, Suge Knight came in. He was the only one that was able to come up with the money to get him out on bail. Yeah. You know, he was broke by this time. And then, you know, that, that path led to his ultimate demise about a year later. You see what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. yeah. All... Baby, what's the? You know, I've always Bro. learned no matter what it takes, if a woman is that you're intimate with is angry, you do not let that woman walk out of that house angry. You 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 apologize for some shit that you shouldn't even be apologizing for. We just get her happy, get her calm, so she is not she doesn't turn around and 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 get back at you. You know what I'm saying? True, true. But there's a deeper thing that connects to this whole thing. Is the truth. If you deviate from the truth, you're going to pay for it. Yeah. This brother was not living the truth. Wasn't living who he was. I'll take that to my grave. I mean, I don't care what anybody says. Anybody who lives a lie is going to not heal. I mean, you're going, you're going to, you don't get away with a lie in any way. You, you skirting from the truth, your system knows that. And when it comes down to it, if you're not authentic, you're not who you are, you're going to pay for it. And so to me, this whole thing just kind of wraps around to that. If this brother, I believe, like, again, I think the takeaway is if you're not living truthfully, you got to hold up this lie. And I believe that's the lie that took him out of here because I got to behave like a gangster. And he does stuff that he feels a gangster would do, which every gangster 
that has been interviewed said, I wouldn't have done that shit. <laughs> yeah. You know, I wouldn't have jumped on Orlando Anderson. No, no, I, mean, I knew he was here. But he goes and does that because he's in character. And what happens, happen. You know what I mean? So, again, like, hey, I think it's, it's about truth. And this imagery, man, this, you know, what, what, what it can do to you. You know, if you, you got to, you got to live that lie. You got to behave in this way that you're not. And you can't go, hey, man, this is who I am. <laughs> We're wrapping it up. It makes me feel a little bit more, uh, you know, respectful to Tyrese. At least you're you're being honest. <laughs> you, this is how you feel, brother. I, you know, even if that's, if that's my little brother, I'd be like, yeah, just you know, keep this on the, on the low. But if that's how you feel, I think it's more healthy that you just be who you are, man. Yeah, you know, I just interviewed the uh, the two Nigerian brothers who were involved in the Jesse Smollett hoax. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk about living a lie. <laughs> mm. Yeah, live a lie. You pay for it. Yeah, that that was a wild story, man. I mean, he basically got together with um. What was interesting about this story was, you know, because these are two Nigerian guys that are trying to get into Hollywood. And Jesse at this point is, is, you know, one of the stars on a big, you know, TV show. And he basically, I guess someone had like sent some, uh, some hate mail to like Empire, you know, with like a bunch of like homophobic racist stuff about him and, and they didn't really react to it. And he felt like, oh, they need to pay more attention to this. So I'm going to stage this whole hoax thing, right? And uh, the way he was explaining to them was like, yeah, he said, oh, this happens all the time in Hollywood. You know, like the Kim Kardashian kidnapping? That was all a hoax, too. Which it wasn't. <laughs> Which it wasn't. I've never heard of that. Yeah, I've never heard yeah, of that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the guys are actually arrested, the, the, you know, and, and in jail for, for doing it. You know what I'm saying? Okay. But, but they're like, oh, okay, we'll, we'll just go along with it. He paid them $3,500 with a check <laughs> that they found. Yeah. <laughs> he still owes another $500 that he never paid. He paid you guys thirty five hundred dollars with another five hundred after you guys were done. That he still hasn't given us to this day. Yeah. Yes. And it was just like such a ridiculous story. It's just so ridiculous on every level. Like <laughs> they're instantly, you know. I mean, the fact that like I remember even telling them, I'm like, yeah. The moment I knew it was bullshit was when the police showed up and he styled the noose around his neck, <laughs> like in his apartment. Yeah, he's gonna yeah. walk around like that because like a chain. Like, yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> that that is the, that that. I mean, sometimes like reality is funnier than fiction, right? He called himself the gay Tupac. Right, he did. Yeah, that? I heard that. He yeah. said, "I fought back. I'm the gay Tupac." Yeah. Well. Yeah. The real Tupac actually got. The straight Tupac actually did get beat up by the police. Mm -hmm. Remember? Like his face was all fucked up and everything else like that? No, I don't remember. Yeah, no. He got he got beat up for jaywalking, basically. And he started arguing right. with the police and they just beat the shit out of him. Uh, you know, I, his brother Mo Preem talked about it. He, he took the pictures and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The real Tupac actually did it. But the gay Tupac, no. It was the, the, real, whole thing the, was a, the, the, the real Tupac alter ego. That's not the real Tupac, though. Well. That's the thing. The real Tupac never liked the police. I mean, he he grew up in a in a yeah, black panther maybe, in a maybe, black maybe panther. so, but the real Tupac wouldn't have gotten in any of this trouble. You want to hear something interesting? And, and this was something that we uh, we just did a, a series of interviews uh, with these Compton cops that kind of went into all this. When Tupac got killed, when he got shot, and the uh, you know by Orlando Anderson, and when the police showed up, uh, Chris Carroll, the first responder. And, you know, he went to the car and Tupac fell out of, you know, when he opened the door, he was f covered in blood. He was trying to get a, a uh, death confession out of him. Right. He said, you know, who did this to you? Who shot you? And Tupac said, fuck you. Said, fuck you. Cause he realized it was the cops. Right. When Orlando Anderson got killed and, you know, this is the, the, the Compton police were talking mm -hmm. about this incident. When, when, when there was this big shooting that happened in Compton mm -hmm. where it was like, like a triple murder or something like that. And, uh, but when they showed up, Orlando was still barely alive. So the cop, the Compton cop was like, 
yo, did you kill Tupac? You know, tell me now, you know, this is, this is your last moments. And Orlando said, fuck you. Mm. So the two guys who killed each other both had the same mentality. Both of them would not cooperate with the police. Right. In their final breath. Right. So just sort of very ironic how mm-hmm. it all just sort of fit together. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, you would tell that to somebody you trust, not a cop. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like to the end, you know? To the end. Yeah. I feel you. But it just shows. And how do you know it's the end? You don't know it's the yeah, end. Yeah, you don't know. You think that you're probably thinking, oh, I'm going to pull through and yeah. I don't want to be a snitch. Right. You, it's never been the end before. So, yeah. You, you, I've gotten <laughs> shot before, right? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, I mean, they have the whole Tupac Dear Mama uh, series right now on Hulu, which is uh, pretty good, actually. It's just, it just amazes me. It's, I, I look at it as, I'm, I'm just amazed because of the image versus reality thing. I'm sorry, I can't get away from that. Because people, even to have that series, it's upholding a person that you believe was the the voice of the downtrodden. He was, but a person that lived this life, that you, you kind of have this inference that he lived a certain life that he did not. You know what I'm saying? That is, that is amazing to me on some level because it's like, not to say, like, well, Martin Luther King lived a certain life and everything was consistent with that. This man created an image at around 19 Mm. that has so pervasively influenced people that you believed that this was somebody who struggled a certain, it lived a certain lifestyle, you know, and adhered to that lifestyle similar to Orlando Anderson. Which these two, if you took an Orlando Anderson and a Tupac story and followed it, that's not the same story at all. Those are two di- different people. But you know what I mean? But the but yeah. the 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 world would believe that Tupac came up like um you know like uh, uh, Keefe D like. That's well, not yeah. the case. Yeah, and and what's interesting is that in this uh, interview with the Compton cops, they basically said that Orlando became a hood legend. Okay, Orlando Anderson. Well, at the time of this particular shooting, he was already a legend in the hood because there's no doubt in my mind, which I agree with you, that he was the shooter of Tupac Shakur. Okay, so he already had legend status in the hood over that. Which probably ultimately led to his demise as well. Yeah, because, yeah. you know, he went out like a gangster. Like, you know, he it was it was a situation with these guys that they kind of, they owed him some drug money or whatever else, and it turned into like a shootout where three people died, including him. And, and you know, before it even happened, uh, Orlando was being investigated for multiple murders. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? But here's the interesting part in all this. And I actually brought this up in the KPD interview. And of course, I got the answer that I thought I would get. But the story has always been that Orlando killed Tupac, right? It's never really been questioned all that much because it, it sort of makes sense if you connect all the dots, right? This is the guy who got jumped, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And then when Keefe D, you know, did the confession, he said that as well. But... But remember, there were four people in that car when this happened. And what I heard, and I brought this up in my interview with Keefe, I know someone that was actually there. He was in the car behind Tupac and Shook's car when it happened. And what he said is that the arm that he saw reach out the window and fire the shots was not a skinny arm. It was a bulky arm. Orlando was skinny. Other people in that car were hefty and mm-hmm. big. And when I brought that up, keep like, well, I don't know. Well, I was in the passenger seat. No way, you know. I'm not saying it's you. I'm saying that there's four people in the car, but they said it wasn't a skinny arm that, that stuck his hand out the window. Who the witness? Can't say. Okay. They, they lying. 
Were they there? Yes. They were there. Okay. Only witness it was was Shirley Knight and, you know, me. Only one per two persons left. Of course, he's not going to say it was him. <laughs> but there is a chance, and we'll probably never find this out, but there is, because everyone else in that car except for Keefe, he's dead right now, right? Yeah. There is a reasonable chance that Orlando wasn't the shooter, but he took credit for the shooting. See what I'm saying? Yeah. There is that chance. Okay. And, and it's interesting how people will run with, you know, like, like for example, like I was supposed to do an interview with, uh, with Gucci Man, right? And, you know, there's this this famous story about how he, he killed this one dude, Pookie Loke, and, and it was a home invasion that he was set up by a stripper. Yeah. And he killed this dude who ultimately died, you know, in, in the, the forest nearby, you know, in the woods. And, 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 you know, Gucci's got the teardrop tattoos and everything else like that. But recently on No Jumper, this guy who was Gucci's, Gucci's like right hand man came forward and essentially said that he was the shooter. So they said that he was he was the shooter, not Gucci. Because okay. I, when I was supposed to do the interview with Gucci, I was like, I'm going to dig into the story. Like if we want, you know, he was asking for a lot of money for the interview, so I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, if I'm going to pay this money, I'm going to dig in the story. And his like manager was like, nah, nah, he doesn't want to talk about it now, because he probably knew that I'm I'm going to come up with all the, <laughs> you know, all the facts and yeah. and all the little details. So listen, I don't know. To me, I don't think Gucci was the shooter. But it's funny to me how a person, but he's got the teardrop tattoos on his face and, and he and he raps about it. You know, he he has this famous line, you know, you know, he said, uh, go dig your partner up, but you won't say shit. <laughs> you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, and you know, and so forth. So it's interesting how people will run with this tough guy gangster image yeah. for it sometimes not to even be true. Yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's psychologically kind of it's a, it's a trip. And it's like for somebody to say I'm I'm the shooter, what, what's wrong with you? Yeah, the hell's wrong with you? Why would you even say that? I would never insinuate that I could possibly be the shooter of anything that I've ever experienced in the past. Right. Ain't, that shit ain't coming from me. Right. I wasn't even there. <laughs> Who are you? I don't, yeah, yeah, who am I? I don't even know where I am. I got to go. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> okay. This is a different day and age, man. Yeah? Yeah. Um, one of our members, Darrell uh, Bess Wadley, uh, he actually brought up, you know, because, you know, Jerry Springer just passed away yesterday. You did a movie with him. Yes, I did. Ringmaster. Yeah, I did Ringmaster with Jerry Springer. How was that? Peace. Great. We had a great time, man. Uh, it, you know, it, the movie, I believe, had something to say. It was like the behind the scenes. I mean, and and Jerry Springer was just so like, he was just so uh, open and transparent about everything. He, he was a deep cat. He didn't take himself too serious either. What was your role in that movie? I played Damon, I believe, with... Uh, with Wendy Raquel Robinson, who's an amazing freaking talent, still to this day. Demond, yeah. Demond, yeah, yeah. And uh, so I'm, I, uh, I, what was the, I was cheating on my girl with her friends. That's my character. And then there was mm. the whole inner thing with, um, with, uh, uh, I, I slept with my stepdaddy. Which was, which was, um, you know, that uh, you slept with your, no, 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 no. The other, <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, I got it. The other storyline right, was, you know, no, it's, it's, uh, but yeah, it, uh, it, it was, it was, it was a cool movie way back in the day. Yeah. You know, I, I wasn't that far removed from the guy who slept with my girlfriend's friends that, I can't say that that <laughs> was something I never experienced back in the day. Right. Yeah. So yeah, know. this movie came out in uh, in ninety eight. Um, was it ninety eight? Yeah. Okay. Uh, after Spawn was it? Ex uh, oh, this was right after Spawn. I guess so. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it didn't get the best reception. It wouldn't. It wouldn't. Uh, the consensus was it was a crude, idiotic mess of a film. <laughs> I don't, I don't agree. The, the, I film, was, the uh, film won a Golden Raspberry Award for worst new star with Jerry Springer. 
Uh, and uh, yeah, it didn't do well at the box office. It cost $20 million to make, and it made about $9 million bucks. Did it cost that much? Yeah. This shit didn't go to me. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, Jerry Springer has this interesting kind of um, legacy. I, I mean, I remember someone broke it down to me. What I never realized was like, people on his show, they fight, but they don't really fight. If you yeah, notice, they're, no one, they're they're, they're goaded. Yeah, like, but no one like if you notice, no one ever gets punched like in the face. You never see a tooth come out. You never see a bloody nose. You never see a black eye. They sort of just kind of like yeah. wrestle with each other in a way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, think about. It. I mean, think about it. if it, if it was totally real and you put two men in the room together, two adult men who are really upset over their girl sleeping with both of them. Someone will get knocked out at some point. Uh, that's not my belief. No? The average person don't know how to fight. The average person does not know how to I'm fight. I'm just saying, out of, out of the decades of this show, you never see a single actual injury. Well, they I go at it, they I get separated, and they sit back down. Show, but like, they, they sit back down and they continue the conversation every time. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I might have watched a handful of those shows. I don't know. Do, do but, you, do you but feel... I've seen a lot of real fights, and people don't know how to fight. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Yeah, I watch, I, I watch fights like a ref. I'm like, yo, man, I mean, this part of me that's like, just you know, think it through. It, but it, you know, I, I don't know. I'm a fight nerd, though. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I remember. I think I told you the famously. I was at the studio when Snoop's group crew and. Uh, Matt Ten's group got into this fight, and it was the funniest shit I'd ever want to see. Because there was these big bodyguard type of dudes. That was, what you want to do? What you do? <laughs> and I was like, "What the fuck?" <laughs> and then Snoob's guys came. Was coming back, and I thought they was coming back with guns, and they had like two pit bulls. I'm like, "Get him, Sparky!" I was like. The this is some dumb shit right here. But like, it's like, that's, it's just funny to me because there's this inference that people know how to fight. A lot of these guys, they don't get in the gym. They don't learn how to really, really scrap. And it's on the street. Yeah, people just don't know how to fight, you know? I, so when I see that kind of stuff, it's, it's kind of funny. Speaking of fighting, one of our, uh, one of our members, a tribe called Breast. <laughs> This is his name. Are you kidding me? I swear to God, this is his name. I did not make. I did not make up this name. He pointed out that Rocky Balboa got inducted into the Boxing Hall of Fame. That's hilarious. Not Sylvester Stallone. That's fucking hilarious. Not That's Sylvester what I'm talking Stallone. about. Yeah, yeah. Rocky Balboa, the fictional the character, fictional character, was inducted yeah. into the Boxing Hall of Fame. Yep. That, that see, that's that's like Scarface, like you know. Like Tony Montana yeah. being, you know, honored with as a, as a real gangster. That's amazing to me. Yeah. What's interesting, actually, is that uh, the uh, journalists uh, actually criticized this, mm. primarily on the basis of the fact that Rocky Balboa had lost too many matches to be considered a true champion. He did not so deserve to be deeper. awarded, not because he's an official character, but because he had not won enough. That's, we, we've, we've jumped the shark, man. We. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, man. Is America getting this dumb? Because it, it only could come from America with this dumb shit. Like, so they're going to really debate about this. The fictional yes. character hasn't won enough. Yes. Because, you know, he lost a lot of fights, right? I mean, every movie he pretty much loses at some point. Yeah, the fictional character. The fictional character. It's, it's, Bro, I think was it Rocky II was the only movie that he actually won consistently through the movie. Wow. Right? Because remember, he lost to Apollo Creed the first fight. The first movie, that he beat him in the second one. Mm. The third one was what? Uh, Ivan Drago. For I think that was the yeah I, I don't know. I yeah think, the, the Russian. Okay, no, I guess he I think did. The he third did one beat is, uh, is uh, Mr. T, right? Oh, was that was Mr. T the third one? Then, I think it was Rocky Four. No, 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 no. The second one. Oh yeah, right, right, right. Because the second one, Drago kills Apollo Creed in the uh, ring. Oh shit, and that he, was the second one. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think he kills Apollo Creed. In the ring, I don't think so because then, then the second one he 
No, 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 no. He beats Apollo Creed. Yeah, yeah, right. No, I'm messing it up. I'm messing it all up. Okay. Right. Here we go. Okay. So the second one, he beats Apollo Creed. The third one, there we go. The third one, Apollo Creed loses to Ivan Drago. He dies in the ring and then he comes back and beats him. But then the fourth one, I think, was Mr. T. Okay. And Mr. T ends up beating his ass. I thought I thought Mr. T was three, but I I guess guess not. Because then you know the because Mr. T was with uh, Hulk Hogan and mm-hmm. that whole thing and living. It, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, I get uh, no. Nah, they're all meshing together to me. Well, hold on, Rocky Four was Drago. See, that's what I'm, 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 I'm messing this all yeah, up. Yeah, I'm messing this all up. Right. God damn it. Wait, which wait, hold on, Mr. T. Hold on a second. <laughs> it's funny. And look at look at us. We're talking three. about like, like this is Rocky a real three. situation. Like this is he a wasn't real. Rocky three. God damn it! I'm messing this all up. Yeah, I'm messing this all up. Okay, yeah, Clubber Lang. Yeah, this is Rocky three. Rocky three. Mister T. So, so, Rocky so, three. So hold on, Ivan Drago. Rocky, Rocky four is I, Ivan Drago. Um, uh, Morrison, Tommy Morrison's Rocky five, I believe, and I think. Rocky Four was Ivan Drago. There, there we go. Okay, there we go. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Stallone to oh, me. Oh yeah, here we go. So first one he lost to he he lost to uh, to Apollo Creed. Yeah. The second one he beats Apollo Creed. Yeah. The third one he loses to Mr. T and then beats him at the end. Yeah. Then the fourth one Ivan Drago kills Apollo yes, Creed yes. and he go comes and back and, gets, and, and yeah. wins again. Yeah. The fifth one's T- Tommy Morrison. Yeah. He fights him. At, yeah. And he's with his real son right. in that movie, and I think that. I think he deserved an Oscar nomination. I thought uh, Sylvester Stallone was amazing in that really? movie. Yeah, I thought he was amazing. And, and the guy and the guy died of of AIDS actually. Who? The 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 guy um, Tommy Morrison. Yeah, Tommy yeah, Morrison yeah, yeah, in real life. Yeah, yeah, actually yeah, died died yeah. of AIDS. Yeah, supposedly a descendant of uh, John Wayne. Oh, really? No, That's why he was called Don, Tomy the Duke Morrison. Okay. Yeah, that's a tragic story. Yeah. Uh, yeah. His, yeah, his story. Messed up. Um, was there a Rocky Six? No. Well, then it, I think it becomes Creed at that point. Oh, okay. Oh, maybe. I mean, one of them, one of the last ones, his acting it was it was to me. Rocky yeah. Balboa came out in 2006. Yeah. Then, then that's the one that I thought. And then it came with then Creed after that. Because cause, cause Sylvester Stallone was in the first Creed movie. Yes. Because Creed is the son of Apollo Creed. Right. Right? <laughs> Michael B. Jordan is the son of... Are we talking about our stories. <laughs> 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 That's what it feels like. <laughs> okay. And too many damn Rocky movies, yeah. man. Um, I'm, 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 mm. uh, we just lost Harry Belafonte. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I actually met him maybe about 10 years ago at Jamie Foxx's house. Mm. That's a real legendary dude. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was in contact with him when I used to do a lot of things with uh, Jim Brown. I did a we, yeah, they were kind of the same crew together. Yeah, the yeah. Amer I Can uh, Foundation, and I mean, it was great uh, learning stuff from Harry. And uh, Harry was no joke, man, man. And you know, I, I was like, he. You know, we talk, we would do these things together. And the next thing I know, he invited me to come to something that he was having. But I was like, it was in South Africa. I was like, what? It was like in the middle. I didn't have that that kind of time. But it was like, that dude was like a real life, like global superhero. The things he was just doing on a regular basis was yeah. incredible. Yeah. And, you know, he, he inspired uh, my movie that I directed and wrote. Which one? Uh, Outlaw Johnny Black. Oh, he inspired Outlaw Johnny Black. Yeah, yeah. He and did he Sydney ever play Portia. any cowboy characters? Yes, absolutely. Okay, uh, th- he's th- before my time. I mean, you know, th- this man's like. Uh, well, you act like I'm so damn old. Well, like no, 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 no. no, no he's just, not before. You, you, no, no, but but you, I think you just study yeah, Hollywood, Hollywood yeah, yeah. more than I do. Yeah, but like we're we're, we're similar ages. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so so yeah. I mean, so, you're, you're actually an actor. <laughs> I can tell you more about hip hop than than, than you probably. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know absolutely, absolutely. So that's all I'm saying. I'm not trying to. Yeah, but yeah, uh, but but there, there's age actually shame, shame you or anything else with, like that. With um, with Outlaw uh, Johnny, Johnny Black, that's kind of a you know homage to Buck and the Preacher. Oh, One of my favorite was, movies. That was yeah. a Harry Belafonte movie, and uh, Sidney Poitier directed it. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. And actually, there's a there was a clip that I put up on um, on Twitter. 
that has Harry Belafonte, Sidney Poitier, myself, and Byron Menz. Uh, and like, I had no idea that I used almost the same font in my movie as that. So we pulled it up. Um, but yeah, it's like psychologically, th that movie meant so much that it's almost like I memorized things. And the the actual uh, color scope, the you know, I, I we we really made it look very much like with with Black Dynamite, like it was shot in 1974. Yeah, man. Listen, Harry Belafonte uh, is the definition of a legend. I, I didn't even know. I remember when I was at Jamie's house and I was talking to uh, this woman that was with him. She was explaining to me, like, like for example, the the, the the Jewish song, Hava Nagila, mm -hmm. he actually popularized that song. It wasn't Jewish people. It was actually him. Because I guess one of his wives, his ex-wives was Jewish. Oh, I didn't so he kind of dug into like her her heritage and the music and he actually popularized this really popular Jewish song called Hava Nagila. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? But that was him who actually performed it and got it popular. Him. Really? Who's not, who's not even Jewish. Yeah. You know I mean? Kind of in the same way that he... You know, like, uh, you know, Daylight, come and we want to go home. Like, mm -hmm. that was, that's an old song. Oh, yeah. It's like him digging into, like, uh, Caribbean culture and finding this yeah. old music and then suddenly putting it on TV. And, and everyone's like, oh, this is incredible. Like, what is yeah. this? Thinking that he, it was an original composition. But no, it was like he, him actually digging up this really legendary, timeless music and, and yeah. putting it in front of a, a TV audience during right. that time. and. I remember even Jamie Foxx was saying how like, you know, because he was basically, there was like a little fundraiser for Harry Belafonte at Jamie's house. And he was saying how Harry had the chance to really ascend in Hollywood, but he cared so much about black people that he wouldn't take certain roles. And and and, and he was yeah, doing he was, a lot of things. He was that offered was, roles that, that Sidney Poitier ended up taking. Mm. Yeah. And like even um, Lilies of the Field, uh -huh. Lilies of the Field, or yeah, um, the one that um, Sidney Poitier got the Academy Award for. Uh, you know, Harry was very Lilies deep, of the Field, yeah, yeah, uh, very deeply political at, at that time, and um, you know, somebody who I, I really admire and look up to, and I have you know in the past I've had a lot of occasions where I've uh, done. Uh, projects and um you know re outreach type things with him yeah and i guess outlaw johnny black is going to have a theatrical release absolutely is there a, is there a date uh, an september? approximate date we're up about september 14th or 15th really yes yeah. oh. in the theaters you got to go to the theaters i, I got to go to this premiere yeah actually it, it, it is my follow-up to black dynamite but yes. it says a lot and dare i say this is what's been happening because in, in the in the in the screenings People are saying this is better and funnier than Black Dynamite, but it actually has a lot of a, a lot of substance that I really want to get out there. Uh, I've seen it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I saw, we, I, I saw an know. early cut. I'm not sure yeah, what the final cut. cut is. You yeah, know? the final cut is another step above. I'm sure it is. Yeah, yeah. Right, because this didn't even have color correction and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, so, yeah. so there's a lot of cameos from, it's very much like Black Dynamite. There's a lot of cameos from like major folks Right. right, yeah. Except yeah. for Samuel Jackson. I was really looking forward to that yeah, cameo. I'm yeah. not going to say what the cameo was, but you told me off camera. Yeah, 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 yeah. What Samuel Jackson's cameo was going to be so epic yeah. if he had pulled that off. Well, yeah, but Can Samuel, he still do it? Can he still go back and reshoot it? Samuel L. Jackson graciously was going to do his cameo from this, basically he just got in a back surgery and still was going to come do it. That's what... That's the great. That's the biggest movie star in the world. The most money making movie star in the world was coming to do the, the movie. But I, I couldn't, in good conscience, have him endure, endure that kind of pain for this. But I, I hope he does it for another. I got other movies. I got other movies. <laughs> you got more. Yeah. So. Right. So yeah. But but yeah. But I was so blessed that uh, the community read this movie, saw what it was about, and saw the messages that I'm trying to say in this thing. And knowing that it was originally uh, from Greenwood, like which was pre-Tulsa, you know, Black Wall Street. Mm -hmm. That story I'm trying to tell was a story that's 
that's happened throughout history uh, over 60 times in different communities where uh, black thriving communities met their demise at, um, at, at uh, this hostility. And um, you know, telling the story, but also I'm telling it in a different way, but um, offering a, uh, some solutions and, and, and offering kind of a story that I think can uplift people. And I, I really wanted to do a movie that we evoked the feelings that I had when I was young. And I watched these Sidney Poitier and Harry Belafonte movies, and I could watch them with my whole family, you know? Yeah. And watch them over and over and get something out of it. Yeah. So that's, that was my goal. And Great I, film. I think I got it. Great film. I watched it. I loved it. And uh, you got another movie that's actually out right now called A Snowy Day in Oakland. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Which is an interesting title because it never snows in Oakland. Yeah, yeah. I that, did that movie like five years ago. It just finally we talked about out. it last time. I think they changed the name or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my man uh, Dion Cole is in it. Yep. I just had him on the show recently. Dion did a great job. I love Dion Cole, yeah, man. Yeah. I, I absolutely love it. Yeah, I was in the theater and people were crying. Crying because of a Dion Cole. Like, oh, yeah. That, that, that scene there, he wraps everything else up, and he, he did that. My brother, like, he, he I, I had to call him on that one. That he, he did a great job. Oh, yeah, man. Now, he's, uh, I remember we were talking about, uh, he, he was in You People. You know, okay. the Eddie Murphy, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Jonah Hill uh, movie just came out. And I guess uh, when they called him in to do it, they just told him to ad-lib the whole thing. Mm thing the whole thing we was freestyling really? i remember kenya called me up and kenya was like hey man i want you to be like a wedding planner and i was like oh okay cool so i was like let me find an outfit that looked like a wedding he was like no 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 you just you're just, you're just gonna be a regular motherfucker and i was just like what he was like just a regular motherfucker <laughs> that's showing up in your street clothes yeah basically. yeah just just a regular dude who probably shooting dice is going to put this wedding together. I was like, oh, okay, yeah, that's fun. And then he, you know, they had lines, and then he just let me go. He was like, just go. And playing with uh, Julia Louis-Dreyfus and, and Eddie going back and forth, man. It was it was crazy going back and forth with them, you know. Mm. And yeah. yeah, and he just did the whole thing. Uh, I mean, who else? Uh, Nicola Ree Parker is in it, uh, Snowy Day in Oakland. Um, Marla Gibbs, who we've interviewed, mm -hmm. is in there. Um, Kimberly Elise. He was in... Um, Evan Ross. Yep. Yep. Uh, Loretta Devine. It's a nice, nice little... And Loretta Devine is a, is a treasure. Yeah. There's nobody who could do what Loretta Devine does. She needs her own freaking series. Mm. She's amazing. I just, yep. just finished working with her this last season of, uh, of uh, Kingdom Business. She joined the cast. She's unfreaking believable. Right. And uh, you got a, a Bollywood film coming out. Yeah. Mr. Nine, Do or Die? Yeah, MR9. MR9, yeah. sorry. Yeah, yeah. MR9, Do or Die. Yeah. Is this your first, like, Bollywood film? Yeah, yeah. Yep. This is uh, one of the areas that I always wanted to tackle. Uh, I've, uh, you know, people don't realize that in, in, in India, India is the largest English-speaking country in the world. Mm, okay, got it. Billion people, they speak English mainly. And they have their own uh, movies that they do. They don't have to... Bollywood. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so that's, a, that's an area that I've long wanted to visit, uh, long wanted to do movies with... with uh, their ilk with with their their stars, and I met a number of them. Um, got some plans on, uh, to do another movie with another huge star over there, and, and Vijay uh, Jamwal. Hmm. Yeah, great action star. So we got plans. How's the Bollywood money compared to the Hollywood money? Is it more, or less, or about the same? I would say more. More. Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, yeah. You got a billion people. Yeah, so I'm saying that's why I'm asking. Like, yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah. Like, we, we've never really. Uh, I've interviewed a couple dudes. Mm. Like an Indian rapper I interviewed. Uh, it's comparable to China, which you know you've got. Yeah, and and they're they still have DVDs. They still do things that way. Oh, really? Yeah. Very cool. 
Very cool. Hmm? Michael Jai White, always a pleasure. Whenever right. you come in, man, uh, yeah. looking forward to all the film projects. I got to watch Snowy Day in Oakland. I haven't watched that yet. Yeah. It's, it's still in theaters right now, right? Or is it? I believe so. Or is it on demand? I believe so. I've got about five movies coming out. Man, you are the most working uh, I, Hollywood. I, I got the movie with Tyrese actor. coming out. You got uh, what? Yeah, I got the movie with Tyrese coming out. It's, oh, okay. It's called come, come Out Fighting. Did he cry during the filming of it or did he ask for child support help or no? I'm ignoring the hell out of that right now. <laughs> and I'm going to say that it's coming out March 19th. No, 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 no. May, May 19th. Uh, May 19th, Come Out Fighting. Myself, Tyrese, uh, Hiram Murray, uh, Dolph Lundgren. Okay. War, World War II movie. It's about the actual uh, uh, Black Panthers. It's, it's 635th uh, Battalion. Oh, they were called the Black Panthers. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, yeah. So it's got a lot of history there. It's a, it's a good movie. Yeah, because I, I just interviewed uh, John Sally, who just got back from filming Bad Boys 4. You know, with Will Smith. All right, yeah, it's being, it's being filmed right being now. Being filmed yeah. right now in yeah. Atlanta, yeah. yeah. I asked if Will slapped anybody on set. Oh. I'm happy for Will. Did he uh, slap anyone on set or? No. No? Okay. But he, but, <laughs> you know, and people always tell me, like, my, my family would tell you, I tell them, they go, what's going to happen? I said, the next time I get $50 million, I'm disappearing for 90 days. Oh, gee. There you go. Shame on you. <laughs> Shame on you. <laughs> but you got to do your thing. Okay. Did you watch the, the Chris Rock special? Oh, yeah, I did. I did. I did watch the Chris Rock special. And I think you, everybody think? watched it for that last Just part. Just for that last yeah. part where he called yeah. Will and Jada bitches. Yeah. Uh, and so forth. What did you think? Because I remember, you know, you and I have a very famous clip, one of my biggest clips, where I asked you what, what you would do if Will yes. Smith slapped you at the... If you were on stage and, and, and Will stop Smith... It, just stop it. <laughs> 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 It's just not a conversation, is it? Yeah, and I never Oscars. even answered it. You didn't even answer <laughs> right, it. But it right. became like what, five million people tuned <laughs> right. in to watch it. Yeah. You know, when you saw the way that Chris Rock handled it with his stand-up, mm -hmm. what do you think? That's what I figured he would, yeah, he would do. Um, I, not, not a huge Chris Rock fan. I watched it. Um, you know, I mean, I, strategically... I think they knew what they were doing. People, oh, yeah. people, it was that slap, you know, it was, it was kind of compensation, mm -hmm. basically. And he got paid a lot to yeah. do that. Yeah. yeah, he got a huge bag of money to do it. It became yeah. like Netflix's biggest, like, you know, comedy special. Was it? Something like that. I think, I think it outdid uh, the Chappelle ones. Just because That's everyone, everyone wanted sad. to, everyone wanted to hear what he had to say about the slap. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes I get frustrated with that. Yeah, yeah, that, that's you know, strategically kudos to them, but damn, yeah, that's nowhere near in comparison to some Dave Chappelle, you know, to me. Mm, I thought it was a good stand-up. Uh, you know, I'm a Chris Rock fan. You yeah. know, Bring the Pain, I thought, was one of the epic stand-ups out there. The, the old ones. The yeah, old ones, the, yeah. The old ones. The old ones. And I thought uh, Tambourine, yeah. man, I'm, I'm a Chris Rock fan in terms of stand-up. You know what I'm saying? So so to me, it's like I thought that he was he gave a solid performance. I mean Chappelle, I mean, Chappelle's a beast. Chappelle's yeah. a beast, but you know. I, I think Chappelle like hides amazing social commentary with yeah. stand-up. He's he's doing yeah, he's doing way more than stand-up to me. Yeah, I feel that, that that cat is on, on another level. I feel you. Yeah. And, yeah. and I just want to say, you know, uh, you know, prayers go out to Jamie Foxx. I believe he had a stroke. Now, now that I the news is it. coming out, it seems like it was a stroke okay, uh, yeah, on yeah, set. Yeah. And um, strokes are serious. Um, you know, my grandmother, half her body got paralyzed from a stroke, which she never recovered from. Mm. You know, she was bedridden for the rest of her life because that's what happens sometimes in severe cases. Right. Like, you know, you, you basically, something blocks... The, the flow of blood into your brain and depending on how long it is, a lot of damage can get done in the process. The fact that that we haven't seen a video of Jamie, you know, telling everyone he's okay and stuff like that makes me think he's probably not okay yet. 
Yeah, I, I would I would think think that as well. Yeah, he's I very much some, active on social media, is what I'm saying. Yeah, I've he- I've heard something about um, him uh, having problems in the past with cholesterol. Mm. I don't know if that's just possibly a rumor, yeah. but it came through somebody who I believe knows him very well. We have s- some friends in common, but I I, I held back on anything because i know yeah the, the media is controlling a lot of different things and and i don't even I, you know even though i you know i have the, that friend in common i don't want to be one of those guys hey man what's really going on yeah come yeah on. i'm not gonna p- pretend that i'm but that that close that that makes a lot of sense now that you say it because i had high cholesterol and when i uh you know when i met with my cardiologist and he put me on crestor Mm-hmm. which he says that essentially every cardiologist takes, <laughs> you know, that he knows, including himself. He was saying that the level of cholesterol that I was at, I was in the the danger zone of a heart attack. You know what I'm saying? As well as cancer. Oh boy. Yeah. He's saying that at, at, at a high level of cholesterol, all that cholesterol going through your blood, a lot of problems will start to occur. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So I, I took my health very seriously. I got on Crestor. I started to work out. I lost 30 pounds. Yeah. As you know, yeah. you know, we talked about it in the past. Uh, in fact, I even got a, uh, a genetic testing uh, program that actually tested all my DNA to see sure. if there were certain things that I might be more uh, susceptible to. Mm. Uh, I did this one uh, cancer test that you could take that, that tests for like over 100 different types of cancer at the molecular level. Yes. So let's just say you have cancer of your, you know, I don't know, Forehead. Forehead. You know, it'll see, hey, listen, there seems to be a, an early warning that you might have cancer of the forehead. You should start treating it early and potentially getting an operation early to cut it out if this is, you know, I, I've had skin cancer before, mm-hmm. you know, but skin cancer is very yeah, easy to fix. Yeah, 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 on my cheek right here. Oh, gee, okay. Yeah, I had, a, I mean, man, this shit is serious. I mean, I remember yeah. I had a little red spot on my cheek that wasn't going away. It was a little, you know, when you touch it, it was a little bit of a... Mm. You know, a little sharp little pain when I touched mm. it. It wasn't going away. I went to my regular doctor. She gave me some cream and didn't do shit. Mm. And then when I remember, I went to a skin doctor and he said, well, let's just do a biopsy. He came back and said, oh, that's skin cancer. We got to operate right away. Wow. You know, skin cancer is very easy to do because it's on the outside of your body. Yeah. They just basically cut it out, look under the microscope, see if, the, if they got all the edges of mm-hmm. it. Then that was it. Mm. Then you just got to come in and get checkups and everything else like that. Gotcha. The internal cancers is what are right. scary ones. Yes, sir. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? But uh, yeah, man, I, I went. I went really kind of. I mean, listen, I'm turning 50 this year, so I was just like, let me let me go ahead and get as many. You know, I have health insurance, so let me get as many tests as I could do. Let me go to as many specialists as I could do because, you know, uh, I'm trying to live. I'm yeah. trying to stick around. Yeah. You know, <laughs> we actually just did an interview. Uh, earlier this week with this guy named Brian Johnson. Brian was, well, he owned Venmo. He bought Venmo at one point Mm -hmm. and then sold it uh, along with another company that he owned uh, for $800 million. And he spends $2 million a year on just his health. Okay. I, I, I get that. $2 million. Yeah. It's called, and basically it's to the point where he's, he's got a team of 30 doctors. He um, takes like 90 pills a day, <laughs> which is kind of crazy. And, and he- that's, that's similar to Dwayne Johnson. Oh, Dwayne does the same thing? Dwayne Johnson. Rock? Yeah, he, he, that, that, he takes a lot of like preventative, I mean, He's yeah. very up on the oh, health. Yeah. No, he and he eats. He basically he put his whole thing on auto drive, where basically he eats very specific vegetarian meals, exactly nineteen hundred calories a day. Certain types of foods. He does certain types of exercises, and you know he does skin treatments and everything else like that. Where he basically he's he his biological age was reduced by five and a half years, which is like a record. Yeah, but I, I, I'm a, I'm a firm believer in that. As you know, you know, I'm very close to you know Dr. Bob Goldman. Yeah, he told me about this. He's one of the, you know one of the top yeah. um, you know anti aging doctors on the planet. Mm-hmm. In fact, um, 
tomorrow we're we're taking off in seven seven a.m. tomorrow morning. We're taking off in a Black Hawk helicopter. Okay. Yeah, and then we're doing. I, I do a lot of tactical training. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah, I've been, I've been I've been working on getting my black belt and a lot of tech, tactical okay. stuff. So I've been doing. Um, I, 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 you know, for for years, and you know, thus you know, you see, you know, you know, I'm I'm kind of very into the mm-hmm. the culture, and I've I've had the carriers permits since I was 21. Mm-hmm. So, and I was almost a cop, but so, I, and part of my enjoyment is I I I go and do these maneuvers with uh, actual like Marines and Delta Force guys, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, is is part of my uh, kind of hobby yeah but we are we're taking off in a black ho- a helicopter and we're we have a mission we're we, we're gonna be i'm gonna be running through the jungle at this time tomorrow where in in uh outside in, in uh in nevada in nevada okay yeah, yeah yeah so we we take off uh over here uh and then uh at a private airport and then we're gonna be we're gonna be going th- i'm gonna be surviving off of rations and things like that Ooh, so it's gonna okay. be fun yeah, I'll let right. you know uh, if you know if you if I, you don't hear from me like you know, <laughs> yeah yeah because I'm like I might be stuck in the jungle for a while. You but be yeah, all, uh, Tropic Thunder, right? <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> yeah, but uh, you know, hopefully, I'll let you know how it goes. Yeah, I mean, listen, I, I remember our last interview. One of the things that really struck me, like I still think about this on a regular basis. When I remember I asked you, like, what was some of your secrets in terms of staying in shape and everything else like that. And you said, I mean, your body, your health is the only thing that you really own that somebody can't take away from you. So I kind of look at it like uh, it's it's nothing about kind of just this discipline thing. It's it's I get to do it. I get to train. I have the right like, you know, this is a right for everybody. Hmm. And people talk about like, oh, I don't have time. Like, OK, l- let's put these things together here, because you say you don't have time to, you know, to put into your health. There, I would argue that taking care of yourself gives is the only thing that gives you more time. Yeah. And I always think about this. I, I always think about this. You're right. I mean, the clothes we're wearing, the cars we drive, the house we live in, the money in our bank accounts, the jewelry, the people around us, we don't own none of that shit. All of that comes and goes, but your body is the one thing that you truly own. And if you do not take care of it, um, you know, listen, I, you know, I have a relative right now that had to get her, her feet, you know, amputated because of diabetes. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, and this is someone, you know, that's something that could have been prevented yeah. if you just took care of yourself leading up to that a little bit. I, I like, think you know, you, you don't go from healthy to getting your foot chopped off. Like there's years of abuse that lead up to this. Yeah, that is that is the most precious thing you have is your health. Yeah. Anytime you lose that, you know, you know, hearts out to, you and know, we to Jamie. And we will lose it eventually. Yeah. We will all yeah. lose it yeah. eventually. Yeah, one day, like I always look at it like one day I'm going to require a cane. Yes. I want to stave that day off as right. far as I can. Yeah. So the fact that I can run and jump and do these things, I'm going to celebrate that. Yes. It, it is it's not discipline. It's it's a it's a right, you know? Yes. So I, I would just encourage people, come on, you know, make some time for yourself because yeah. that gives you the more more time yes. at a better quality of life. Exactly. Anyway. That's what it is. Michael J. Right, White. Until <laughs> next time. All right. Peace. Take care.